Okay, so um, introductions as I must, and then hand it over to Vikram. So he's a performance storyteller and theater practitioner. I think most of you must have come across his work. If you have not, it's it's very inspiring and do what look him up on social media. Um, he's been uh, in this industry now for 20 plus years with theater conservation and social work. Uh, he's based out of Bangalore and Chennai, and uh, he has spoken at multiple events uh, on the power of stories and theater, like the TEDx and quoted in various media. Um, he has traveled extensively. That is exactly why he is right now in Ahmedabad uh, for performances and for uh, speaking at public spaces like community libraries, schools, corporates business conferences, literary and cultural festivals. What is more important is that he works with both age groups, that is children and adults. Um, but uh, And we all always wonder, how did he get into this? Because he actually is from engineering and management degree uh, from IIT. So Vikram moved on to being a full-time arts practitioner after working with uh, in the consulting and marketing domains with IBM and SAP. Um, I think this is exactly why he also must be able to work with corporate and the art sector together, which must be a, a good blend, and we learn more from him. Uh, he believes in the Desi way of storytelling as a strong medium of conservation from nature to human relationships, as his histories are rooted in folklore, myths, and legends inspired from various communities of the site. He strongly believes a story a day keeps the doctor away, not an apple. So now we know where to go when we're not well. Um, on a personal note, I am very mesmerized with the work that um, Vikram does, and I got the first taste of it when we had invited him in 2017 to meet our students who were working with a project on contested heritage. Um, and it was very important again at that time when we had just come back from the field with a lot of uh, raw data, what to do with it, how do you make sense of community and community stories whether it is for a cause or whether it is for uh, to drive a solution as a designer. And that session with Vikram in terms of using storytelling as a tool to interpret information, I think was very critical, which takes away the, the pressure of being that hardcore researcher. I thought since then, I, I've always been reading up more also about uh, myself on storytelling as a tool for the kind of work that we all are doing. So when we th had to think about this workshop, uh, thinking of Vikram was inevitable. Thank you so much, Vikram, uh, for accepting the invitation at such a short notice. In fact, thank you to everyone for being here at such short notice, because that exhibition closing and this next workshop just back to back was too much for us to be pre-planned about. Over to you. Thanks, Ishita. And uh, yes, I think we've had parallel journeys. So I think as parallel as uh, she's followed, I've also followed her wonderful work with memory, with how spaces and us connect. If you think that's very cold where I am, no, it's not very cold. That's why I'm wearing a t shirt inside. And if she takes screenshot, it should look nice on the frame. No, that's why I'm putting the shawl on. So that's all. So we all <clears throat> uh, know how to dress up for Zooms and uh, online. Good things because I had taken a picture now and I'll be See? putting it in Facebook. So you see all the angle and all this. Is very but I was just admiring. It's a nice uh, stole or a shawl that you're wearing. I realize that the best thing is in India is when you travel, you, when you pick up. So I, now, now I dress pan Indian. So like my shawl is from Manipur, my kurta is from Gujarat, my pant is my pasty is from the railway league. But the end of it, all of it keeps us warm. Uh, and so where you're do we Indian at heart. Very and I don't know. And also is complex now nowadays you can't even because you're doing a storytelling in a desi style yeah that also like desi is also now we have to look at what is desi so we'll get into it slowly so beautiful so uh i'll keep it conversational i mean um and uh in case like uh, just keep tell me in case we need to add something we need to speak something more and uh, i know putting the mobile in front and holding is very difficult so i don't know um Nijum and Kastav, i hope you have a steady space where you look at the cam for phone is entry you can show me your hands you know why <clears throat> so the most common thing between indians or at least the part of where we all belong to we, none of us talk through our faces we talk through our hands so that's why it's called i call this hands free than the wire because invariably communication happens through this so which means that when you talk that's one way for me to connect is how your hands are moving if your hands are not moving, which means you're talking from here, not from your heart. Have you noticed that with people? 
and people are really passionate in talking, their hands will move. But if people are rehearsed and know the text, we'll speak as well in the mic as if, oh, really? So this is what happened in India 40 for seven years back. The hands will be this. So one way that you definitely know somebody's talking from the heart is look at their hands. If the hands are clutched, it's rehearsed. If the hands are free flowing, they're talking from the heart. Because that doesn't need rehearsal, right? And so that's now why... I'm not being more conscious of myself. Self that I speak with my move, move yeah because, because I mean where do we, this hand is, tells so much about us I mean um and yeah so that the formal way of Indian way of talking is I say use your hands use your legs because if you stand straight you'll sweat in your pants you have to put your legs apart and stand and that is not cool no but then that is the most coolest way because that's cooling the legs so the free-flowing body what they call what the, the Nataraja pose what we if we can stretch our body and talk, that's a much beautiful way of communication. If you've tried it, beautiful. If you've not tried it, next time just go and talk. Even if you don't have grammar and full stop, your hand will finish the full stop. This in India is full stop. No? And that's why it is. Yeah. And this, which language can document this? Or this? This is such a powerful tool. People have used this for blessings to shut your mouth to everything. So that's why I say hands, practice your hands. It, it comes in hand, needy where communication is not dependent on language. And a little bit that I've traveled in India, I don't speak more than two languages. The language that I uh, speak, <coughs> the land I've come from is Tamil Nadu, the land that uh, they, they say there are two houses for a lot of us. One is the born house, one is the in-laws house. My in-laws house is Bangalore. So I, I was born, at my caterpillar time was Chennai, my um, butterfly time was Bangalore. How many of you have two cities connections? Or three or four? And today we're all moving into this migrated life, right? I mean, we're all migrants who, um, and in Bangalore, a lot of times I've had, I'm sure you've also come across, they'll say, no, no, I'm a Bengali. Hey, in Bangalore, you're the, how can you be Bengali? You're a Bengalorian, no? So we, Today, to look at city as identities is slowly evolving. I mean, we always thought language is our identity, cultural roots are identity. But today, I may not be a Canadian, but I am a Bangalorean because today, uh, um, like Ishita and both of us, we do lots of stories of Bangalore history, is what we weave our work practices around. And that doesn't make us less. I may mean, not be a Canadian by language, but I can be Bangalorean much more than a Canadian. And that's the power of cities and um, spaces today because we are moving around, we are all. Uh, absorbing spaces this identity uh is, it can be and you can be a core mangalite hardcore i mean i'm well i, I don't be a jakku right but i can be a core mangalite so I, I know that you're all from different parts of the world so quickly tell me which cities you all are shweta Odisha. hi Vikram. i am uh, from Odisha. i grew up in kharagpur studied at hyderabad and then have worked in vadodara vishakhapatnam and currently in jodhpur I'm in Jodhpur right now. Okay, I should have been in Jodhpur this week, but then so Jodhpur has a festival, Kitabo, which is a children's festival, which yes. used to happen until 2019 and pandemic. And if you're there, meet Ira Sisodia. She's a wonderful person. So sure. he will take you. And she's the one. So yeah. So as per record, I should have been in Jodhpur today and tomorrow, but it didn't happen. But yeah. Baroda is another Garka Bumi. I mean, uh, uh, so I have a house in Baroda. So yeah. Alkapur. That's Oh, hey, I worked in Alkapuri, right across the railway station. So, yeah, yeah. so I say it's one, one, Baroda is one city in which everything that I love in my life is around Baroda. The zoo, museum, market, railway station, bus stop, all four kilometers, and the palace. Yes, so like and a, all best. roughly at five minutes from anywhere else. Yes. Anybody wants to look at heritage in India in one thing, go to Baroda, from where you are, five kilometers, the best, oh, I mean, I'm saying best in the sense, uh, the, the, what you can get, you get lost. Super. Shweta. So yeah, I'm from Baroda. So <laughs> that is my starting point, Caterpillar phase. And uh, I, I, I'm i very upset that you didn't mention Garba when you said Baroda. I was never there in Garba. <laughs> so I come from a place where for us Garba is sitting quietly and seeing steps called Golu. I know, I know. <laughs> Yes. So we 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 the like southern part of India is very quiet during it's like the indoor garba. Our indoor yeah, garba yeah, is like yeah. sitting in inside room. Very good. Yeah. So I I've, I've never been to garba. I want one of my itineraries to yeah. Baroda garba. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. so uh, that and then uh, hometowns are in bombay and uh, bhavnagar i have a very strong connect with bombay actually um, i find it uh, i don't know it's food for soul and i live in bangalore so i moved to bangalore 25 years ago so which part of bangalore i live on kanakpura road which part of bangalore but kanakpura so the thing with kanakpura sarjapur hosur yeah. road all the 30 km stretch right so i am very close to nice road kanakpura road junction valley uh, school and in the morning leopards in the evening yes yes <laughs> Leopard. Yeah, yeah. We are always given warnings that there is a leopard on the prowl over here. Yeah. Well, leopard, no, they don't give leopards warning that uh, human beings. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of snakes, leopards, a lot of wildlife around where I live. Yeah. Cherish it. Another set of five years that won't be there. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> Sony. Okay. I uh, I was born in Ulas Nagar. Out of it. Ulas Nagar, somewhere in Delhi, yeah. Yeah, so it's on the outskirts of Mumbai. It is known as the USA of India. Oh, Ullas Nagar, but that's Ull Ullas USN, no? Ah, okay. Why USA? Uh, Ullas Nagar Sindhi Association. Ah yeah. Wow. Ah, then uh, Mumbai, and uh, now I am in Guntu, which is in Andhra Pradesh. I'm mean, actually in the non-existing. Capital called Amravati, but uh, uh, two, I, I realize there are two Amravatis in India. Eh? One in Maharashtra, one near Nagpur, and one in uh, Andhra or Telangana. Two particular. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Super. Just three. Vastly three, from chilies to pohas to everything you have. Super. Shrinidhi, of course. So, I'm coming to Geetha, ma'am, last because I know a little bit. So, yeah, I'm so, from so, Bangalore, and. Uh, When, how, when I was getting my Bangalore, Bangalore, not Bengaluru. Bengal, I mean, I'm a Kannadiga, but Bengaluru is not something I grew up with. So I'm like, it's like the Bombay and Madras. It's like that, Bangalore. So oh, yeah, no, it's like Bangalore. Getting... Neshwaram is Bengaluru in terms of history. So the British divided into Bangalore and Bangalore. So Bangalore is the British uh, Koshis and other things. Bengaluru is Dar uh, Darbar. I mean, Benne Masala Dosa. <laughs> yeah and uh, I've, yeah so my field work takes me to work everywhere but because i curate a museum here i'm kind of stuck here so when i told this to my bamboo guy he was like sir if you're born here like most of us you'll live here and you'll die here so unlike most of you have a single city history except for so just okay so so wait take it take it you should enjoy the process today yeah, it is a beautiful you yeah. have no other choice you have to take There's no choice there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I actually uh, I am born in Chandon Nagar, uh, but I live in uh, a small village uh, named Boichi Gram in Hooghly district. So it's my home village. So I'm working here right now, and uh, yeah, just shifted from Hyderabad. I was where I was doing my MFA. So yeah, it's nice. I'm going like that. Lovely. Mission. Mic testing, Zoom testing, Google Meet testing. Yeah, I'm from Bangladesh. Now live in Dhaka, but I'm from basically North Bengal, northern area closer to Darjeeling. <laughs> So many bees, no? Bangladesh, Bangalore, like Baroda. Baroda is also a bee. Already, we are all connected with the bees. Yeah. So I'm from Dhaka now. Lovely. Lovely. Okay. Gita, Gita, go. Ah, uh, I was born in uh, Bombay, and then part of my growing up years in uh, Bellary and Vellore, and uh, my education up till my masters uh, in uh, Guntur and Vishakhapatnam. I also worked there for in Guntur for about five years, and then I get married. And for the past thirty-seven years, I am in Bangalore. Lovely. I know you might sometimes you would have done your introduction, but a lot of times when you do introduction again and again, you're like, "Oh, really? You're from here?" After some hundred introductions, also you'll catch a caring feeling to people. The idea of talking about us is so beautiful. I can't think more than three minutes about us. 
try that sometime. So, uh, because that our data is very, very, very data centric. Our introductions are very data centric. I hope you realize that. Like most of the things that we share about us is our data, and nothing about us. So we don't reveal our inner self in our introduction. And uh, that is where I'm going to start with saying that moment we start sharing, we will connect across us. And uh, <clears throat> where do we go from there? So next time, see if next time you when introducing how much how how much we hold back ourselves when we introduce ourselves. A little bit, a lot. But a lot of times when we introduce, we give data points in a such a way that it's only our, which is there available on our uh, LinkedIn profile. So that, and to do that is where we sort of trigger memories. Like when um, Shwetal said Garba, there's a certain memory of the space that's triggering a memory that's common for me. So see how much you can trigger memories through our introduction. So, uh, something uh, I'm just going to start with. So where do we go from here? I think I have about one and a half hours. So <clears throat> all of you are sitting or standing. Yes. For sitting, standing also exists. No? So the reason I'm is put on the cameras again, put on, put on, because uh, I'm going to keep doing it because I can't work with cameras off. So I ran away, and this is my first online workshop after the pandemic closed. So I've been making sure that I see faces. So take your right hand. Screen is the I know it's tough, but if you can do, if you just say yes, if you're doing what we're saying, at least an oral voice I can hear, no? Or like, ma'am, internet weak. Ah, that's all. I need to know you're alive, you know? That the, the thing with the online world is every time, how do I know you're alive? And uh, take it around you and put your hand in somewhere around your space where you find an object around you, the 360 degrees, swing your hand as if you like pull, like going gaga, like whatever, and pick up something that's around you. This is not, don't take a bed and a sofa and all, I mean, something that's pickable. And if you can show it on the camera, beautiful. Now, I want you to just keep it with your hand and just keep it in your hand. And are these things around you because are they garbage or are they of some use to you right now? You can put it in the chat window, you can unmute and talk. But if you don't talk, I will sleep over. I have narcolepsy, so I can sleep over just too much seconds. If it's total garbage, then it'll be in the dustbin, right? Why is it there in next to you? It's my office. I'm not asking philosophical I'm asking a practical question. So ADHD means it's some use to you. Now we come back to that. If not, it'll be in yeah, that's the difference. If not, we will also be in the dustbin. Yes. Other than other is useful, okay? Yes. Very yes. finished its temporary use. Temporary use, okay. But use the word use is still there, okay? Something with which I cannot do. It has to be with me most of the time. Uh, it's my office bag. That was my office bag. Oh, you have an office bag, home bag, separately. It is of use, right? Okay. Sorry, it's my pillow. So pillow is very, very useful. Okay. Now, fathers. Now, for example, let's say Tonisha is. Tonisha, just show your object. For others, is this useful or a gar? I'm just using the word garbage to an extent that it is not useful. For others, what is it? Is it useful? Not useful. Use. It is when it's needed. Her object, not yours. Don't make it yours. I'm saying right now, if Tonisha gives it to you, is it of use to you? No. No, I don't think. Okay. Now, similarly, let's say Sony, take your hand back. Fathers, again, don't get philosophical, spiritual, gender based, all don't, don't get to that topic. Purely from right now, from utility. Uh, I've done enough of workshops in my life, so I know where answers can go. So come back to me. Right now, fathers, what is it? Don't tell me, wow, where did you get it from? No, I'm not asking that. Answer. <laughs> if she gives it to me, it will be useful. If she gives it to you, that we'll ask her after the workshop. But now she's filled it with her things, right? I mean, how her items are not, is that now there was, as a bag, as a content, 
right now she gives it to you is it useful to you i would still say yes yes okay scavenging solo okay now keep keep this as because it's an it's an emotion that's coming in okay now curse of your object oh it's yes. a foot ruler foot ruler it's a centimeter ruler it's not a foot oh it's a foot english that's a funny language no, why is it useful okay useful okay shweta yours Sweetal, sorry. She just, she just eaten it and this line. Now tell me if it's useful. You didn't say if she's watched it. See the, see the difference. I mean, there's a huge difference of the object, the state the object is going through. Mm. As a... yeah, so because we know the context of it but i would say not useful but if i had not known its context then it's it's as neutral to be useful love others she just had a breakfast and just put it next to her very useful now okay. no, not useful because i prefer to use my hand most of the time lovely okay go on go on. Okay. If it's minus 40 degrees and the hands are already frosted, and then it doesn't matter how if she's eaten with it before three hours or one hour, one minute, I need the spoon because I can't hold that. Okay. Sony? Depends on what I'm going to eat. If what I'm going to eat is poker. Oh, no, 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 no. This depends can go until from Faludas to. Uh, Gadbad to ice creams to parathas to dosas to idlis and that. But as such, when you see Spoons that spoon, you eaten it and kept it. Now tell me, would you use it? No. Yeah. I okay. think it's also interesting that we're limiting ourselves to think of it only as a spoon to be eaten with. Correct. Yeah. It can Correct. be used for many other things in the in a. How many you catch your back with spoons and forks? Sorry, Sorry, all the time with the four two days <laughs> Yeah, if now if you go into um, let's say any of these heritage places, they do sell a fork which is called a back scratcher. I hope you've seen it. Back scratchers are now very much demand. Back scratcher and head massager. And the typical wooden ones would now be replaced by cheap plastic ones with the same color. We won't mention the country that plastic comes from, so we'll be nice to that country. Okay. Lovely. Okay, my last object. Um, Gita, ma'am, you want to speak? Useful. It it follows the logic of Costa and Sony's. Yes. Yeah. So, what is changing between these objects now? I mean, for example, all of them have a certain utility, but what does the pen have a difference to the tablet, to the spoon? To the bag, where we where where are we? Where do you think is the difference in our? Because for everybody, that particular object is useful, right? Like for Tonisha, the tablet is important. For Kausta, the ruler is important. For Sony, the ba so bag is important. For Swetul, the spoon is important. Geetha, ma'am, the pen is important. For each one of you, the importance for you is the same. But when it came to the other person, it was a spectrum, right? Yeah. Zero to hundred. For each one of you, it was hundred. Let's see. If not, we don't keep it next to us. I mean, we would have put, we would have thrown it away. If the pen was not writing, we would have thrown it away. If the bag was torn, will you keep it? Like, oh, I love my bag so much. Let me have this bag at my bed. Or the pillow, for example. If the pillow has cotton tatters or it's not being used. And the same, like Nijum's pillow. Will that for you will be hundred like percent yes? Or a zero to hundred? There'll be a spectrum there also, right? What you'll say? Can I see the color of the pillow? Or can I see the pillow? Some sort of secondary question comes. Now, I want you to feel why do we go through that? Why do we go through that certain things like the like pen, for example, yes, 100% I'll use it. But whereas for the spoon, I give it a second thought. Mm -hmm. And don't tell me, again, go into your own emotion. I want you to feel what went through you for you to look at it. 
and the sample can increase this limited sample is what i'm we're talking about for me it meant that whether it is of any use uh, right now so when it is of uh, no use it does not hold much value can we can we even go a little bit emotion could you feel an emotion when these objects were shown to you i wanted to not touch. much okay not much to some extent but not much for the simple reason to some extent, people here to some extent itself is an answer so we're saying to some extent there is a yes to it why are we negating an emotion to these and we so what i will slowly come into that saying when you think to some extent there is there's no emotion we will not keep these objects in our houses there's an emotional baggage to it right i mean yeah so the word so, baggage even if it's a baggage is an emotional baggage yes if it needs cleansing or no it's different but we do have our emotions to the objects that fill our life it can be anything between 0 and 100 i'm not talking it's so extremely emotion like a spectrum look at everything around you look at let's say now um you had one object now can you i'll give you about 2 minutes time you pick five objects out in your room and come back 37 you want to switch off your video or you with your videos on just go around five objects that can be fit in the hand if you're back then put the cameras on that's only way i know or give you a thumbs up okay so these five objects I and mean, this is an exercise that you can try for yourself um on a <clears throat> if you have a paper or if you have something on your laptop or your mobile so these five objects if you <clears throat> uh put them in a vertical column and mention these and then from a zero to 100 spectrum just look at them and i want you to for the first thing just take your, let's you name the one two three four five and show the first one to the camera okay so this i want you to hold it in your hand i mean both your hands and i'm not going to no, no you don't have to answer the question but just tell for you uh, when i'm questioning it just answer for yourself when did this object enter your life how many hours in a day do you spend with this object do we write the answers do we answer up to you that's up to you i mean this is your self exercise okay but hold it with you. I, mean, I want you to hook, keep it in your hand. And uh, as I tell you, I want you to like, imagine you're having a conversation with the object. Has it been with you in your happiest times or your toughest times or both? Or when? Is there a time that you've lost it and searched for it? Was there a time when somebody else took it and you was you were annoyed or angry or irritated at somebody is even using, touching, or have having access to you, that object? Do you spend time alone with this object, or you, do, you can use it when you are with people or in the public, or you like it to be just between you and the object? Have you taken it out? Is it, a, is it an indoor object? Like you only use it at home or in your room? Or is it an outdoor object? Outdoor in the sense you've taken it out into other spaces. Is there an expiry to this object? And does the expiry come from you or from it or them? I repeat, does the expiry come from you as a human being or that particular object has a certain life cycle after which it expires. Is it a first hand object or has been used by some other person? Does the object have a smell, taste, touch? Because the other two, of course, we know. But does it have a taste? Does it have a touch? Does it have a smell? What would be your immediate reaction if your object? expires right now expire could be broken or lost or taken away from you expiry can have multiple generations right this moment if that object expires how will you don't don't think spiritually please think practically spiritually you can say ha ah, life goes on right now what is the irritation that happened to you don't we get irritated of course we get irritated and is this object 
something that you plan to hand it over to the next generation or you don't even know how long will it be in this earth is there somebody in your life that you can give this object to with ultimate trust second is it such an object that needs to be handed over with care is there some place in the world that you want to take this object and sit with yourself which is outside your house somebody, somewhere how many colors are there in this object and what incident happened for this object to enter your life was it a micro incident or a macro incident or there may be some process or some episode that happened for it to come even if it's i'm ordering on amazon that's an incident right nothing comes without a without knocking on that door or we not we creating that space so now i've offered you questions now each one of you can you think of a question that you think can add to what questions that i triggered so add one question each one of you can raise a question for others um which other object does it take you to this object if i may please please is it an object that you rank as least used but you realize that it is the one that you need to pass on with greatest trust good good yeah how does this how does this object connect with other members in the family lovely does the object trigger memories of trauma bring in bring in memories of trauma that's really this lovely so uh why did you choose this object right now that's why did you choose yeah. given so many things around you why did you choose this lovely yeah that is and don't give answers i mean this is all for you to process it for yourself so don't even be trigger to answer it tell a story around the object or so rephrase think of it if it will be does it have a story or you does it have an autobiographical story or can a story be told around the object for itself right okay. ah, so i'm saying the thing of the question how, how would you frame it okay, can be does the object have a story or does it have a story to tell that the, the sentence framing lovely choose one choose one Choose. Okay. Any personal associations? Let's make it autobiographical. Nice. Okay. Is that a question or is that like saying that we have enough of object? Let's move away from object. English is a very funny language. Can you do away from the object? Okay. Kita, ma'am, Nijun. All the questions have been asked. The last person doesn't get to only process. I, think that I, think that I can't think of anything. Had enough questions. We're still asking more questions. So. Give it a thought. Give it a thought. What did you? The object add any value to your life? Does it have any value? Okay. I'm picking from past and saying that's the that's the object after to pass an exam to come into your life. I was going to put that question a little differently. The value, where I was going to say, if you had to sell it, how much will you price it? If somebody wanted to buy it from you, how much would you? cost I mean yeah that yeah, was a was a price over in a slightly different note again about value if you lost it right now 10 years from now will you miss it <laughs> lovely now just keep adding questions whatever comes to you just keep pouring it I mean there's no order how do you keep it where do you keep it how do you keep it yeah is there a way to keep this object in a certain way, <laughs> like very simple, a pen has to have a cap. If you got a cap, a refill pen, something. There's a certain way to keep it. Up. I don't. I don't. I don't. Can the can it can parts be easily procured or is it difficult? If anything goes wrong with it, lovely. Is it is it is it the integrated object where you can get parts separately? Yes. Lovely. Or is it a single piece? See, there are questions. How do you 
Which part of your body? Something as you with that object. Lovely. Which part of your body touches this object? Sneeni, you said you're outside. No, so much chatting you can do from outside, right? Eh? But you can't put your video on. Hmm. Okay. So so now that these questions are processed, um, how much? I mean, this is again. How much of did it shift your relationship with the object? At least, like a one percent or a point one percent. No, for me, I just discovered this object right now. <laughs> so, and a whole world opened for me from there about memories, thoughts, how that it's actually very strange. It's a bottle full of cotton uh, balls, which actually my son uses to mute out the light in his table lamp. And uh, suddenly, I'm like transported into my son's world and his way of thinking and all that. So I'm actually I didn't know this thing existed until I saw it, and I was wondering where these things are in the lamp, where they've come from. So yeah, it's in my house I think since years, but I haven't seen it. Lovely. Okay. What was your question? Sorry, I missed it. I'm trying to. The question is once. With with these questions and triggers, your relationship, your emotion with the object that you've chosen, is is it increasing a little bit at least? I mean, point not 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 one percent. Once you know that, because we, I think with the questions, it got strengthened for me. I knew that because this was the fifth object I picked up, but it was more like, oh, why didn't I pick this up first? I felt bad, and then with these questions, mm. it felt. It got strengthened. Oh. Okay. So when will you discard this object? Just answer that one question each of you. What, what will happen? For example, if it's a mug, if it breaks, you'll discard. Can't sip with a broken mug, right? Yes. So when will you discard it? I will discard this, maybe not throw it out when my power increases or decreases. Done. That's only discard. Discard means when you're wearing it, it's used. When you don't, this is discard. So discard doesn't mean the dustbin. We think discard is the dustbin. Anything that's not used is somewhere discard. Right? Then a new Other... secret monk happens when Another I buy another. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> it will soon finish I... the diary. So I'm presuming that there won't be more space to write, but I will keep reading it. Um, so I don't yeah. think there will be a discard. See, that's I, the thing. I, no, sorry, go ahead, Shwetan. No, no, I was just saying I don't have a right to discard this object because while I'm in the house, it's, I'm in yes. my son's room and I don't have a right to discard it or even so who, give it a function of any sort. <laughs> beautiful. So whose object is it in the house? For example, the mark, for example, is it 100% your object or is it a shared object? Like you, you, you and your mother share. You and your father share. You and your sibling share. So is it a shared object? It's a shared. It's a shared object. Yeah. So why? Also, um, yeah. So because you're all arguing, we are think very academically, right? Now take these questions to the public. Okay. I come from your world, so I understand why your answers in a certain way because we are all used to an academic thought process. We don't think emotional. We, we are losing the. Uh, the, and the moment you get emotional and do this in a public workshop, you'll see how it triggers. I've done this about 30, 40 times, and I've seen people cry. Because this mug for a lot of women or even children are the only time they spend by themselves in the house. And that's the emotion I'm talking about. Because every object around you is to satisfy a certain not need, but a certain emotion. Yes or no? Yes. Not a need. Need is thirst, but emotion is sipping it slowly. Now tell me how much of emotional engagement do you have with your object? Little or quite a bit? A lot. Because that's, uh, that, that's what I was going to say that uh, the mug is a gift. Ishita showed her notebook. Two of my objects are notebooks, which even if they get over, they will be kept on a shelf because of what they contain. So need is obviously there. My trigger is only your emotional need it satisfied. 
and now look at your object as an emotional satisfier than a need satisfier. The need is documenting your memories, you're documenting your day to day. That's a need. But emotion is, I sit with it endlessly because I need, it's an, I mean, if you can sit with your pen and not write at all, but that's your emotion. You need a book, you need somebody to rest your pen, and that's what it's doing. And that's what it is. And this, for example, a specs, for example, my emotional need is, need is, if I don't wear it, I can't see anything. But the moment it's on my eyes, it completes my sensory. If I don't wear my specs, my sense is lost. I'm only partially sensed. Now, Geetam, I'm telling me, what is your emotion? Is it a need or an emotion? So it is both for me. And now, for need, now it's, first we said need, now we're moving to both. That self is not so. Because a lot of times we look at objects as this need yes. satisfier. And in an archival practice, now I'll come into your word. In an archival practice, how much of emotional archiving do you all do? We, we look at it as it satisfy a need. Let's say, I'm sure you've seen these old uh, nutcrackers, uh, which has designs on it as a need based thing. But look at it as an emotion. The moment you look at the designs it comes from, you will look at it saying it satisfied an artist's impression of the world emotionally. Because I've seen a nutcracker of a, two people mating, one mother holding a child in the arm. And these are fascinating designs, which I saw in a, a college museum in E Road. Seven designs of nutcrackers were mind blowing. And what does it satisfy? So I'm saying even design of uh, vintage objects from an emotional need. I mean, because a lot of design is inspired from nature. Need is, of course, is what we look at it. But I'm saying I'm shifting it slightly because in this country, a lot of our emotional therapy is through our objects. Like I yes. have two nutcrackers here. Mm. Very old objects. Do you still use it? No, it's only for show and uh, now, now look, an bring it closer, closer to the camera, let others also see it. Now, don't tell me a need. Now, tell me an emotion with the design. Yeah, it uh, takes me back to those artists who design such beautiful work. Can today's artist replicate this? Number one. And number two, who was the person who was owning this that I could uh, purchase it from? what what was that person like so and why did it get sold why did it get sold so the person could have either kept it or uh, passed it on but maybe it was meant to come into my hands and i consider myself lucky that way Good. now go into what happens to an emotion when somebody is cracking a nut beetle leaf how many of you have seen an older generation sit and cut and do beetle leaf. You'll see that's an emotion in a lot of houses. Yes or no? And now look at the nutcracker as an emotional because the moment you press it, your entire anger in the day will be used on the. <sighs> now, how many of you have seen a mothers and fathers when they're cutting vegetables? Entire house ka gussa will come on that potato. Uh, 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 uh. So the need is to cut, but there is an emotion to that object. I know. I, I don't know if this is new to you or you know it, but uh, or, because emotion is something we keep away a lot of time. We look at a need, of course, it, and that is why it's in a museum, right? Because if it is not needed anymore, it moves out. Till it's needed, it's in the house. Today's need is tomorrow's museum object or archival object. But what is the emotion it satisfied? And there's no emotion it satisfied. You won't have the things around you in your house right now. It'll be in the dustbin. The pillow. How many of you are extremely emotional to your pillow? Don't tell me I only sleep with it. Cut the knee. Cut, put given the emotion. Zero to 100. You and your pillow. Zero being absolutely no emotion. 100 being ultimate. It's my best friend. It's my partner. It's my everything. Zero to 100. If you want, mention it. And how, how much is it for you? And a lot of Indians, like what I know. We live with 70 to 90 percent, 100 percent of our entire partnership with our pillows. You change your pillow, you'll see how it changes. It will never be zero. And the deepest of the country, 
the objects in the bed is how relationship emotion venting happens so that's where i'm coming from to say that objects around you are not because they satisfy a need they satisfy an emotion in your life example documenting i need to document my life i can't document so i need an emotion called the pen if there's no pen how will you document oral mark okay i need a radio i need a mo mo mobile phone everything is, has a certain need and where does it have emotion to an extent i'll end with this saying that what are your five senses quickly touch taste does, does your object have a touch does your object have a taste mm -hmm, yes. every object has a taste third how would you say a spex has got a taste put it near tip of your tongue give 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 an object to a child a child will not look at it as a need for a child it's an emotion that's experienced through the five senses as adults we are dead bodies the only sense that you're using is visual and now all your objects now tell me does it have all if you say no but how where is the sound take it closer to your ear you will hear for example the monkey you give you the sound of the ceramic it will be anything between 0 to 100 but it will not be zero the every object in one of the senses don't work the object will crumble yes or no yes. and that is that similar to our our five senses which means our five senses connect to the five senses of the object and when it does that our emotions are connected to the object and when that happens, when that stops happening, we move away from our life. Now look at everything around you. You will realize that there will be some sensorial aspect of the object that connects to your sensorial self. And your emotional need will be satisfied. Once you overcome that emotional need, you will move away. So it's not that your emotions are going to need it all the time. The moment the pen refill is over, some other pen will satisfy that emotion. It's, an, it's like a partnership. Imagine you and your mug or your thing is a partner. The moment the need is done, you change your partner. The moment the refill doesn't have ink, will you keep writing with an empty refill and empty ink? So your desire, it has a certain purpose. Partner, I'm saying you need partners of different things in life, right? A laptop is a partner. Electricity is a partner. And then is my visual, look at all the objects around you, it will be because you connect to it visual, like a blanket, like a pillow, touch. If this one of it is not there, you will not use that object. Is there any object around you which is not touching the five senses? I don't think so. And that's where I'll wind up saying that, look at objects or your archival material as what does it do to you emotionally? What did it did to the people emotionally? What did it do to the society emotionally? Because if there's no emotion, things are not created at all. In India, especially, every creativity stems from emotion more than a need. Yes, no, maybe. And objects have the strongest value of an emotion, which a human couldn't give, which was superimposed. Ideally, for a nutcracker, imagine the husband or a wife sat together, took the nut and cracked. Things would be normal because one of them didn't do that. He brought on an object to do the nutcracker. When did these objects evolve? We didn't have these. None of the objects that you showed existed even 200 years back in our practice. We never wore specs 100 years back. We never had a ruler 100 years back. We never had a mug even 300 years back. We had different types of bowls, but mug in that aspect. So we didn't have a handbag. I don't think our grandparents had a handbag. No, Sony? So each one of them that you showed didn't exist in our vocabulary. Even our vocabulary didn't have these words even 100, 200 years back. And when did it enter our vocabulary? And today, why is it becoming an ultra important need? Our earphones, for example, or laptops, for example. Because this laptop is getting to go into, already museums have uh, the IBM machines of 1970s, right? 
fax machine. How many of you seen a fax machine? Isn't a fax machine already in an archival, in a museum already in our own times, which was a utility, which was an emotion. And if you're in the 90s, if you remember, if you have to send a communication, the fax tend to work. People get palpitation. That sound of the fax machine, apart, it's gone. This, now you see Shwetals and Gita Ma'am's express, you'll know how much importance fax machine gave emotionally. That one message, that one yes. thing has and it'll take 15, 20 minutes for it to pass. When it's finished, and then that slip comes out from the post office, you'll be like, done. Yeah. Imagine the trunk calls of 1990s, of 70s and 80s. What emotion it is. Today, even the WhatsApp message, how many of you will see? Under, if you see the blue tick mark, one emotion. If you don't see the blue tick mark, another emotion. Even WhatsApp, yeah. look at it from an archival, let's say Orchid. Orchid is already archived. The word is archived. And when making a trunk call, I remember we used to shout loudly. Thinking that by talking loudly, the other person can hear clearer. So you raise your senses. So again, one sense has to go up for you to complete active. Beautiful. So that's where I'm coming from saying that every object in our life has an emotion, has a human need, which is not, which is much more than utility. And utility is one part of usage. And I hope somewhere in your archive will practice. You will ask these questions as filling this and that will create a story of your object. Now, with all these questions, when you put your answers, you will have your answers. You'll have a story that's slowly weaving. Once upon a time, there was a mug which was green in color. And somebody wanted to go to a birthday party of Tonisha and came to the shop, picked the mug, and came to Tonisha's birthday and gave it in a box. And when Tonisha opened it, they, oh my God, I thought I, my, I didn't have a mug for my next cup of coffee. And this mug entered Tonisha's life. I have questions. So, I look at ordinary everyday objects, right? So the advertisement that came out in a magazine 10 years back around the pujas, for instance, things like that. And they are valuable. They flesh certain things out and we tell stories around them. So two things happen when we are trying to tell these stories. One is that uh, for the person who has actually used this object that has been used in their own living memory, it is very alienating to see it in a museum showcase. So the IBM machine or the fax machine or the pager are so weird when we are talking about curating or museums is because people remember them being used and suddenly it's in a showcase like a relic or a curio. And both are very weird associations to have with these everyday objects. That's one part of it. The second part is, of course, the way in which by using these objects or posters or bits of art is how we are not just connecting to the idea of the faxing but the people who are using these faxes so the so more than looking at the fax machine you're thinking of the people wearing particular clothes using that fax machine whatever it is no matter how stereotypical it is so and that is typically how archiving works right or telling a story around archiving works so when I am trying to tell stories that are on lived practices, that are literally stories, uh, Ishita knows the project that I'm trying to work on. And it feels very um, dubious or unethical at times to sort of objectify and put somebody in a museum showcase and simultaneously, you know, like, so how no, do you? Yeah. I think the Indian, there's a little bit of experience that I've, I mean, I've been traveling to museums uh, and I realize India has museums in colleges, which is not even there in paper. Our definition of museum is very, 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 very small. And if we, and I call it dead bodies if there are no human beings in the museum talking. It's like library. How many, you've seen a library which says silence, please, right? It's a problem. It's a, the word library it mean, itself means human interaction. So museums need not be just a storehouse of uh, uh, items. It has to be an interaction of time. It can be a larger conversation. And these fax machines, it's I'm saying, for example, the utility has moved on. The purpose it's solved because these are objects. And also to say that objects are it also uh, served a purpose and that, perp that emotion is being satisfied by somebody else. Like today, WhatsApp is doing the same emotion what fake facts did. 
the nutcracker for example was used at one point of time today you have other the emotion is still the same human emotions have always been the same the other thing i have missed to say is human emotions have not changed from harappan civilization if you map the if you go to let's say uh, you see the uh, palm leaf manuscripts in some museums and and today we have the same mahabharata online right like the madurai uh, mahatma gandhi museum next to it there is a small museum which nobody goes that has one of the oldest manuscripts palmly manuscript of the ramayana mahabharata the mahabharata hasn't changed the format of documenting mahabharata shifted today bori which is documenting mahabharata is doing digitally so the emotion of documenting the mahabharata is still the same but the tools have moved so now you keep the emotion on top of it and then you see well to look at any archival uh, it can be an object practice it can be even leather puppetry for example like, oh leather puppetry at one point of time was used but the emotion that leather puppetry did 300 years back is still the same today when uh, let's say a movie even what kantara did isn't kantara doing similar thing what leather puppetry did 300 years back yes the emotion is still the same and i hope that answers sort of your question saying our emotions are constant our human emotions have been changed the need is much more today than before because today because of pandemic many things our emotions are even more deeper and with whatsapp we are still communicating to another human being right our voice messages are much more uh, effective today than typing they say and the same thing what trunk call did today we are doing whatsapp calls we are going to google meet and that is how when i see museums or when i visit museums or anything as a question is that emotion what is my emotion connect to it like i'll see leopards and tigers uh first I mean the short ones the huge ones in the uh biology or the human i'm going to say uh, living species museum for example which is there in uh, bhopal for example the bhopal uh, uh museum has a little bit of part of it is uh, uh the royal family then our part of it has lots of leopards suddenly i see lots of leopards inside the first mano sangrahalaya not mano sangrahalaya the other one um, I forget the name. Give me, give me another museum in Bhopal. I'll get not Bhopal. Indore, sorry, 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 Indore. Um, and then you see that this 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 land, for example, was where uh, uh, Ahalya Holkar used to come because there was a small temple and, tem and next to a river, and the temple is still there, but the palace is large. So what is the emotion that carries with the land, with the space? We'll move into space the next one. And this leopard has what is my relation with the leopard emotion? It's just standing there. And we pass across, and this I've noticed with many museums, people just pass, and even like uh, Taj Mahal. People have read, read Taj Mahal, but I've never seen people sit and just observe the Taj Mahal for half an hour. We don't look at what emotions it triggers. Because we've grown up reading about many of these uh, archival things, let's say even um, archival, like let's say uh, the Adalaj of uh, uh, Adal's Temple of Ahmedabad. And people have read so much and they come, but people don't sit and just sit there and look at your emotion. We just come, take pictures and go. That's where I say emotions to objects. Because I have written, it has, what does the South India have to do with Taj Mahal? No history, no heritage, nothing, zero connection. But in some memory of mine, it's there from my LKG to now. But now when I really go into that, so that if that can trigger an audience, because everybody has a connect to, let's say, your practice. Find who's your audience. You'll see what is the emotion that you are carrying it. You'll find somewhere you're answering that. Does it answer your question? Or address your question. There's no answer. Yes. Yes. And that's when for me, emotion is such a strong medium because otherwise, what does me and uh, let's say Nehru have in common? Nothing. But our emotion to India can be same, right? Or similar. Or not. But the moment it does it, emotion is like for example, in Allahabad, if you go to the Anand Bhavan. What, what do I have with Anand Bhavan? No, but my emotion as a South Indian to say that, okay, Patel, Nehru and Gandhi sat on the balcony so that me living in Madras find that, freed, find that question to freedom. And slowly I'm triggering my emotion to Anand Bhavan, which I'm not even there in my landscape. I don't even heard of Allahabad in my younger days. And if you go to Anand Bhavan, the balcony is huge. I mean, they're not allowed to sit, but uh, I, I, mean, I, I just sat there with the permission. Moment said that you realize this is the this is the place where Hindi became the so-called official language. And this can be triggered in any museum. 
like like now in uh, in Ahmedabad, I went to the Sardar Balabai Patel Museum. In southern India, Patel is not even heard of. And then, but what does Patel and me have? Then the 1947, then the map integrating India, the Operation Polo. And then I see where is Madras Presidency, where is Bangalore, where is Mysore. And then I build a connect to Patel. And that is always a constant journey of emotion. And do museums do that by themselves? I don't know because we museums, many museums today are just their dead bodies. But you can, but they have a lot of life giving speeches. Humans need to enter. Technology has entered. I think more humans need to go and sit and have conversations. Classrooms should happen in museums. Like I know somebody in Bhopal who has an NGO where they go to museums and have classes. And that's exactly where, like I'm saying, even this interaction, if it can happen in a museum, see the what difference it could be. And by the way, I'm not an academician, I'm a practitioner. So my answers may not be academically relevant, correct. Any other thought, anything I'll, I'll, I hope objects somewhere, now you look at everything in your house from everywhere. Even for example, Sony's back wall, if you see that small painting there, moment you start asking, what is it for me? You'll at least declutter your place. We have a lot of garbages in our life, emotionally, physically, relationship wise. Moment you start looking at it emotionally, even remove people in our life. When we, sometimes even people are becoming museums in our life, no? I was just thinking 10 minutes for everybody to just go get some coffee or take a bio break, whichever would be useful. But in the meanwhile, I mean, what I what I just wanted to highlight what you said in response to Tanisha's question, I think I'm think I'm saying it from the larger practices in archiving. Um, the whole idea of finding emotions um, in your end users, something very interesting, because I think we, we constantly are looking at this question that who is this project for? And how are we identifying the end readers or end users of an archiving project? So while we have had different ways of identifying them, one of it could be to whom does it emotionally really appeal uh, or connect? I think that's a very, very strong takeaway, not just our emotional association with the archiving material or with the person whose material it is, but also with the end readers and end users. I thought that was a very strong point for everyone to note while they're building their projects. Because then no. we're not trying to unnecessarily spread ourselves to thin, is what I'm trying to say. Because the moment which we say it's for the public, the public is becoming so um, difficult to comprehend who is public and the public constantly changes because cultures change and mindsets change. Then that is where most of these cultural preservation projects fall into a lacuna where they don't know whom are we addressing what are we there for so you have you sort of have an existential crisis but if you were to take it to those who let's say who are missing garba so if i'm thinking of the project that shwetal is doing is it really for the ones who get to do it every year or it's for like people like me who has finally found a place in garba in bangalore where i can connect but for last five years i've had serious fomo so her movie and her archive would be something that I would love to fall back on. So I'm just just putting in examples to strengthen that idea that the end users are emotionally connected rather than only scholarly. Shinidi, you had unmuted yourself. Yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I, I really like this session. It was very interactive, even though I didn't switch on the video, but um, I'm kind of reflecting on um, what sort of uh, emotions kind of come up because um, more often than not, I don't know how, where do you be dispassionate and where not, like destruction of the Bami and Buddhas, right? Or it was an emotion that took down almost all the museum artifacts, um, uh, you know, when there have been so many uh, civil wars or there have been um, a lot of stuff happen. And we've also seen artifacts go down um, during very correct movements like Black Lives Matter and so on. So I'm kind of unsure in terms of how much of emotion and what sort of emotions are you going to uh, look at and also the processing of the difficult emotion. Because uh, what I've noticed is more often than not, museums uh, play on 
um the positive emotion in the sense you know you find a sense of aesthetic you find a sense of intrigue uh, you find a sense of um, glamour um, curiosity but not necessarily of guilt or um of trauma of 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 colonizing of 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 us of, of so many tensions that you would want to sit with your own reflections and museums don't necessarily um engage you to do that self work so um yeah and also how it can kind of ends up becoming a tool uh, of rabble rousing um in terms of uh, multiple histories that people with agendas want to play out and how emotions can lead there so yeah i'm kind of sitting with all these feelings um, as well in terms of how do you now uh, use the emotion in your practice but seeing to add on to that i mean you are a change in the process no i'm saying we say past museums and of course the museums the conflict or museum has done great work in uh, touching topics that you said i mean uh, um the ahmedabad conflict or museum and i'm saying there is no there's no one type of emotion also right i'm saying uh, when you bring in your practice to the world you change it i mean we 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 have a lot of things to say about the past but i'm saying we are all in continuum so yeah so i'm saying what you can do to when you create your museum start why you why are we pointing fingers to others like i say uh, that's the artist's world i mean we all take from the past understand the gaps that we fill and then and that is contemporary practice and handing it to the next generation and these museums have done fabulous work in archiving certain things and we, we make the change and we hand it over because guilt and uh, guilt was never a practice of the museums maybe 100 years back now when you say guilt is a certain emotion in your museum museum practice bring that and when you consult with museums and you go as uh, curators put, put that as an element and there's a lot of work to be done and that's the reason why we exist we don't have work everything has been done but when we we can we, we don't have work we have work because the world is not the way that we think we it has to be so yeah every work is created because somebody is uh, gaps i think this is where i feel like saying this is exactly why we want to do constructing personal archives programs uh so when anisha first put the question also to you vikram i mean i at least wrote in my notes why do we think museumification is the only end goal of these projects so that's that's more like the self interrogation which we all can do with these programs that do we only have to think about it as museums and archives the way we have seen them and that would be the biggest subversion through these kind of programs that we do it differently whatever scale is possible of course we all know the logistical challenges but exactly like i mean i know this living water museums that is happening and she did it completely online i mean the entire notion of museum being physical spaces was disrupted for me also for for a tangible object like water and when zara i met zara i mean like she never she doesn't uh, she doesn't want to take it physical so i'm saying museum is a broad word i mean it's it's a lack of better words i mean no two should be the same i hope that the world revolves into and especially in india it's very plural you can't say oh this and this are similar no like it's like storytelling i say that no two storytellers should be the same then it's plastic i mean you, sh you should be saying oh and that's what with well, i mean what what makes even an emotion connect saying oh in hamdabad this is very unique the collectorium is certain uh, has a certain character and that is where i think and, and small is big we think big is big no small is big uh, i would like to ask what sort of a emotion or a feeling of a loss is attached to objects that are stolen either from the museums or from temples politically or socially no no not politically say from uh, maybe from heritage point of view a feeling of loss of identity because we don't know when it is going to come back whether it will be recovered or whatever so how can that be addressed because there are many temples in karnataka itself wherein uh, many um, uh, idols have been stolen and they are not able to bring it back in the first place because we have not done archiving what is the uh, height of that um, uh, idol what was it made or when it was brought we don't have any any information of sort so much so even if it is uh, found out very difficult to trace it and give it back i mean I've, for me these questions are extremely wide because in temples especially i'm access, when i'm accessing it as bhakti i may ask when i'm connecting to it as a monumental 
structures or as a city's history, the multiple ways to look at a temple uh, in India. And each one triggers a different emotion. If it's Bhakti, is one emotion. Because it, location of the deity in the temple triggers different emotion in the center and the sanctum around. If it's the center, it's one emotion. When it is around the Garbhagraha, it's one. When it's outside the periphery, it doesn't matter to me. So I'm saying, and also the stories that have been coming in here saying, oh, this, oh, this the folklore, saying, oh, this deity is so powerful. And this oral, that's why oral history also has a certain component. And today, it's, it's unfortunately, it also the value that you give it to it. And how do you value it in terms of money, in terms of culture? Who puts the value? And all this creates emotion. Today, when you say, oh, this statue is 1,300 crores worth, who oh, really? Full emotion goes from from uh, uh, Bangalore, it'll go to Switzerland and come back. So what are you feeling emotional? The next question is saying, what are you feeling emotional? Are you feeling emotional because you have lost, like London has this statue and you have to pay 1,000, uh, like 100 euros to go and see it? Or uh, what what triggers that emotion? I'm saying my next question is the same date, it's like saying, the same artist sitting on a platform can charge 10 rupees, sitting in a, a music academy or a, a darbar will earn 1,000 rupees. So similarly, the, the, where the statue is also, what are we think? And like that, we've lost many things. I think the law may be not even lost. The question is, but the, for the earth, it's just a statue. For us, it's a deity. For, and for a museum, it's an archival object. Like if you go to ignore museum in Chennai, there is a Shiva that's in the road. They've kept because there's no space inside. They've kept the Shiva statue on the road that you don't worship, and it's a perfect Shiva. Pure. I mean, I'm sure Ishita and others have seen museums where the deity is outside the museum, like the even Baroda. If you move outside the uh, museum, there's such a large Nataraja in the outskirts that's been kept, no maintenance, and beautiful to look at. It's, it's double sided, and I'm wowed at it. And, I'm saying this, what is, I think, the value that we create to it also. In my, that's my uh, answer. So I'm saying anybody can add on. Because in India, mythology and uh, literature are all interconnected. It's very complex. In Europe, it's a little more simpler. I think like most I people also have yeah. some thoughts. Yeah. I think most people don't feel much about the loss. Then it is only momentarily. It is maybe that uh, local people, people who visit the temple, who have not, I'm ta not talking about religious or bhakti, then who value it as a heritage. It is coming through so many generations, like I said, or who are the artists who have made it, who owned it, who, what went into it. It's a whole lot of science. Maybe for those type of people, uh, heritage enthusiasts or saying it will value more. If it is a, a regular bhakti fellow, he'll come, hoita, ayo, papa, they'll tell and they'll keep quiet. But for a um, historian or a person like me, it triggers in a more emotion of a more depth, saying that uh, God knows where it has gone, so much of uh, effort behind that. It had a whole lot of uh, uh, history, heritage, uh, so many connected with that. Now it is uh, simply gone. And in a, a few years' time, that entire thing will be lost for the next generations also. They won't even remember it. In that uh, terms, I'm saying the loss uh, is uh, much more for people like me. Because when we went to Kikeri Temple, you can see. And the next the, question is, what do we do with the loss? Can't do anything other than feeling helpless, helpless, and uh, raising the sins in the forums like this. Yeah, so so that the beauty of this country has so much to yes. be. I'm saying every centimeter is so much of transition, transition, transition. What we call heritage today was, um, yeah. So it's very. I, mean, I know if you know Charmina's history when Charmina was built, there was a lot of things to not to have it because it disrupted the space. So a lot of heritage buildings today were fought many hundred years back as saying, I don't want this because it is disrupting an earlier heritage and the new heritage came. Many examples. So we've never been, we never had a smooth heritage in India. Everything has been fought wars. None of the heritage we are fighting today was smooth. It was, it was built on another uh, conflicted space. Yes, exactly. So it's, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, that way we can't even take that we don't know because today's contemporary is tomorrow's heritage. As simple as that. Today, what we say contemporary art, which is like a fighting roads yes. and this thing, tomorrow it'll be like, like when Natara Kachari was built, land was given from a garden, a Kaban Park extension garden. And that time there was again question why this land and this land. Now, Natara Kachari is the high court of Bangalore, wow structure. 
Vidhan Sauda, Vahav Shraksha, but that time, no. So when it started, everything was fought. So the history of heritage itself is interesting. And today's heritage is yesterday's garbage. And today's garbage, maybe tomorrow's heritage. Today we say, oh, what a, what a glass structure this has. Maybe 100 years later, it'll be like, oh my God, such Amazon head offers, such beautiful structures. You know, no. No, I, I think I was just reflecting on some of the things you said. And I think this whole, whole issue of emotions uh, coming into play, uh, from my personal experience, what I have figured is that, yes, uh, when it comes to your content, you need to, you look through all the emotions. But I think where I think the distinction and where I think I resonate with what Srinidhi is saying is that when your emotions should not be affecting, at least for me, I have now become conscious that my emotions should not be affecting my process because um, those are two different things. How I feel about it and how it affects my process can, can be, you know, should not get mixed up. So that is one thing. And I think uh, to hold space for these multiple emotions in even an opinionated, um, Mm, uh, even on something that you have a strong opinion about, you know, like you may have a perspective on something, but then holding space for those other emotions. Like I remember that there was a person uh, in my film who who spoke um, about the way men danced today, you know, and he felt that, you know, there is no masculinity in it and there is no... Um, you know, they have lost that vigor and X, Y, Z. And it was difficult for me to uh, digest that because I felt all kinds of uh, body language is okay. It's, you know, it's a person expressing. It's the way a dance form has evolved. But um, I, I did make it a point to include it in my film. And it still is a point of conflict for me because uh, I know that people get uncomfortable when they hear that you know and uh, but at the same time i mean so this is one thing that holding space but i think what i am uh, trying to uh, i mean i'm and i'm just reflecting is that one needs to be aware that one doesn't get drawn into this conflict while working because i have seen my work slow down drastically with with all those things so keeping that in check and i have a cousin who's parallelly working on um, archives and i can and I remember when I was discussing it with my family and we had used this word that, you know, she's dispassionately passionate. So uh, I think that helps when we are working on our thing. But I mean, that's a fine balance, I think. So, so beautiful. I mean, even of no emotion is an emotion. Even to put it out and say, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to keep my emotion away is an emotion. Because we are here, even if it's a job, we, the moment we enjoy our work, it's emotional. So the process to be non-emotional is also emotional. If not, why are we doing what we love? If not, why are we here? Oh, I, I, because we, there is a certain emotion of connect that we love our heritage, we love our archival. So that, and to be aware that, oh, this emotion of mine is hurting my process, itself is emotionally aware to keep it aside. So I think that is where a lot of heritage in our country is Somebody's heritage is somebody's garbage, right? The structure is exactly the same. Like I was in Sarkez Rosa yesterday, and for some, Sarkez Rosa is an heritage. For some, it's a worshipping space. For some, it's a playing space. Like children are coming and playing there. For some, it is a lover's paradise. I saw a lot of couples just come there, take selfies, and go. The, the space is the same. Was it what that what it does to? And same thing with Allahabad and that uh, Triveni. So I'll come to space. That's the next topic. So Tunisha, I mean, go ahead and then we'll slowly open. I, uh, we've, with Geeta ma'am's question, we moved far away from emotions. So thank you. My concern was around emotions. Uh, Shwetal, I agree. I think it's always a very subjective take when it comes to end users. So obviously different people bring in different stories and we try to, I try to use stories to make people care. It'll sound very, 
insofar as it has a pedagogical function or whatever. So if I'm talking about the tigers of Sundarbans, the idea is that if I talk about ghost stories of people thinking about it and everything else, it's not just about exoticizing the jungle or anything. It's just, you know, think about, you feel the fear, you feel the thrill, you feel the dread. You sometimes feel the awe and that will help, hopefully. That will not alienate whoever it is from outside looking at the Sundarbans further. That, so that alienation component becomes very important and their emotion plays a very, very big role because that's eventually just channeling down more and more scientific information is not how it works, especially around these contexts, right? So stories are what you do to sort of, and the, 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 curatorial material or the archives are sort of these glues that are sometimes holding these stories together and making it all sort of work together in this this mosaic of sorts so that 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 aspect of emotions and whether you call it teaching whether you call it familiarizing whichever word you would choose to use and how crucial it is in projects like mine but also uh, the fact of, you know, whenever we, we write academic stuff and we all come from these very strongly emotional points, we care about our causes. But at the same time, one of the first things that we are taught is that we can't write in a bias today, no matter how justified our cause is, <laughs> because that itself will um, take away or that itself will make me lose my audience effectively. So one of the first things that, so I used, say, I'm sure you're aware of it. Khabar Leheria has been making the rounds now. A documentary has been recently made. And documentaries are very interesting because of how they are archiving, what stories they're telling around these sources, interviews, objects, everything, right? So in that uh, documentary, you will notice that Khabar Leheria, for those of you who are not aware, is a Dalit women's journalistic initiative using primarily smartphones. And among all the many clips that are there in that trailer of that documentary, which is not released in India yet, <laughs> as these things go, uh, is that there is a tiny clip of somebody who is very obviously very right wing with a wall of very right wing posters and clothing and sewed and I showed it to my class and we needed to discuss among other things why there was a need to keep that person and his view on the world and how that gives weight to everything else that Kabbal Lahiriya is doing that they would also interview somebody like this so they are not just being very polarized or insular about their work and what does that say about my very engineering students immediately giving Khabar Lahiriya more importance or more validity and that what does that say about our emotions so it's that that's all yeah because exactly. I mean having been a performer for many years so I control what or think of what I more, more I think the more I sense it. sometimes it just has to flow we don't have no control over the audience but not allowing it to flow is today happening because we're too much judging our flow and not believing our emotional that the gut feel what we call gut feeling that's the emotion I'm talking about because we have enough experience to process and let go and today we don't give process the time today I'm sure you also know authors who go to a workshop write books that's where the problem is we don't give time or the process to churn the output today output comes before the process and I think we've and we've valued people. We are value for people or uh, work is we when we know the process or like how we want to say the process, then ah oh, okay. And otherwise, it's um today that like every time I keep going out, I get oh my child's written a book and he or she is aspiring to be an author. So simple to be an author, is it? So yeah, that's a garbage in the larger world. I'm saying women when you're creating content. This is something as a, as a larger thought for me saying the, it's not the content, it's the process. And the process is driven from to two. And the two 
and sometimes we have to believe that the world is not in our control. We should be, the moment we start controlling, and then I don't know, this is where the emotion for me is a certain way saying, but the moment I control that saying, I'm controlling my own self. Super. So the other, other subject that I wanted to touch is, thing is this um, non-human uh, place called the space. Um, like for Baroda, let me take, um, um, what's the garden area that the zoo is located called? The, the entire park? Kamati Park. Kamati Park. Kamati Park. Bangalore, let me take Kaban Park. Any other city are we referring to here? Bombay. Bombay, let's take IIT Bombay, for example. Because it has leopards coming in, Pawai. So I'm giving this Kamati Bag because this Kamati Bag I've spent a lot of time. Kaban Bag, Bombay, I've been once or twice, but uh, let's say Kala Gauda. Mm. So Not these marine, yeah, marine drive. Public, public space. Marine drive. Marine drive. Let's say. And any other city are we here? Are we here from any other city? Bangladesh. Good. Dhaka. Yeah, Dhaka. We don't know. <laughs> um. Kolkata, Kostov, Nijum, is that okay? Kostov, Nijum, do you want to add a suggestion for a public space in in that part of the world? Well, I think Nijum, one public space from in Dhaka. The International Lang Mother Language Day Memorial, Nijum, 1st of February. Dhaka University, uh, give me the airport also. Yeah. So the idea was looking at world around you let's quickly take something around you uh, just put your hand around and pick an object that's around you right now let's do that object around me yeah, yeah. Just, just any object right yeah like three seconds that that fits your hand yeah so now um now this object for you is it does it have a purpose or is it just there you know no i mean there is a aesthetic purpose to it there is yeah and for somebody else who might enter your house will it be the same thing to them not necessarily no so which means objects that we're surrounded with have a certain connection not even need so aesthetic is one need but it also has a emotional need that it satisfies you know, all of this of course mm -hmm. a lot of times we look at objects as only a utility need so where i'm coming mm -hmm. today is to say that objects also satisfy an emotional need so we think people only people you satisfy emotional need you you remind but, me of fetish you remind me of karl marx who says we put emotions into the object <laughs> but you're right <laughs> so the same thing now you extend that into your archival practice just look at whatever you're archiving as a trigger of emotion uh because a lot of time archival comes with utility yeah, yeah, and sure, sure. now look at it from an emotional need both from the, the space it comes from and, and the space sure. of the audience who's maybe looking at it or uh, consuming it, saying that our human emotions have always been the same. That's again mm. my theory. Uh, even hundred years back, our emotions are similar. Uh, maybe the emotion would be today WhatsApp. Maybe another thirty years back it was fax, for example. Mm. Remember, mm. a few days the fax here. When the fax used to go, you used to feel a certain trigger till the fax gets completed, and then you get the final bill out. Mm. And the same thing. Mm. The blue tick. The blue tick is there. Somebody doesn't respond. Again, the palpitation. So how emotion, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Mm. emotion plays a certain role with object. And same thing when you extend it to your archival practice, you will find uh, how uh, and uh, like uh, again the trigger of what Shweta was saying that how to be uh, not too much of emotion and not, but any, uh, never it is emotion. Even not feeling emotional is emotion. Being yeah, control yeah. and not yeah, emotion to, to strike a balance somewhere. Yeah, to 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 actually arrive at a balance is is difficult. Like all the balances we usually struggle with anyway. So. Correct. Because as humans, we still are here because our emotions are connected. Mm, mm, mm. Like across, like when say Europe, Africa, India, what are we common between us may not be our rivers, may not be our food, but our emotions are common. And which means if you think that that direction of archival might be my trigger or help in mm, all your work. Mm, and that mm. at the end of it, it'll help you to storify your objects or your archive material from an emotional way perspective mm, 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 mm. yeah when from the point of view of storytelling of course emotions do play a very significant role there 
versus yeah. academia where i look at where you like you know like tanisha said there is practically no room for very little room really to kind of express emotions um, if it's purely academic writing so yeah 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 because i don't come from the academic back i'm from the practitioner's world okay so <clears throat> from objects the idea for me to look at space is um, uh, most of your archival or what, what the research that you all do will have some space associated with it i mean because even if it's an object let's say <clears throat> i'm looking at a nutcracker the nutcracker would be in an ancestral house at one point of time or the house space is a sort of a trigger to look at um so one thing for example how many of you know mg ramachandran mgr an actor who lived at once upon a time so that's how archive in history is old actors are all archived now and like i have so i asked the school somewhere and i think in uh, rajasthan or somewhere saying do you know mohan das karamchand gandhi he said ha my grandfather's uh, uh, teacher so already our cable of people have happening in our life literally uh, you can check that uh, ask any any children do you know about sachin tendulkar they will say ha ha that old uh, cricket player so people are getting into archival mode already in our own life thing like in another 2 3 years even um, uh, dhoni is archived so where to space so mg ramachandran was one of those superstars of the tamil cinema and he was the first actor or one of the first actors to have air condition in his dressing room so now when i say air condition in dressing room which year do you think this was any idea 1970s okay others i'm just triggering an idea like imagine air condition first air condition in a green room which year before the caravans came in 1990 no. 1960s let's say 1960s <laughs> 1970 but mg ramachandran died in 1987 or 1990 he was not even there in the 1990s <laughs> so 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 he had a special room to put his makeup and this ac imagine 1960s 70s imagine those times when one street had one television and entire street used to go have there so the ac room was the most exotic place in the entire of chennai the mattress and uh, the only person who could enter was of course him and every time he entered the room had to be and the next person who can enter the room would be a very small person or somebody who saw was a celebrity and access to such a room for anybody could be jayalalita now this is outside the door she's jumping the story that is what happened with adults <laughs> and the other person who could enter was this makeup person it's a makeup room of course what is the makeup person has to come and uh, the next person was of course his wife called janaki how much we take things for granted no we judge people immediately say go to jail later yeah and because he did the most number of movies with a single heroine and the heroine is name is jayalalita most of the makeup used to happen for them together in that room which means till he died that room was only accessed by five people totally and this place is in a college called the mj janaki college which is now a college uh, in madras if you go to the marina beach is nearby that and in 2020 2013 and 14 we had a festival in that college a storytelling festival and the groom that was given to us to change was the same green room that mg ramachandran and uh, jayalalita and other actors in the movie used to dress which was again accessed by five people the same space his photo is there life size photo three life size photo of course ac has changed into the modern ones and when i was there there were 30 of us were sitting there and talking and one point of time in 1970 there were 20 security guards outside this room so that nobody enters into the room but today the 20 people are already inside the room what has happened to this space and the same happens to many such spaces in india right like you look at um 
Fatehpur Sikri. At one point of time, Fatehpur Sikri was ruled by somebody called any idea? Yeah, Akbar. And at that time, imagine was it would have been easy for public to enter the fire of Fatehpur Sikri space. But today, how easy it is. And similarly, how spaces create a certain timeline and change over time and also change during the day. For example, imagine a Kaban Park in the night time. A Kaban Park in the morning. A morning Kaban Park is extremely different to an evening Kaban Park. I used to sing with a singer called Shilpa Motubi in the morning for three years. We used to go there at six o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock. We used to sing. And by the three hours itself, things used to change. Now, in your archival space, when you, what do you define? Do you define spaces in your archival practice? Yes, very much. Um, and yeah, so and this is a dynamic space. In some cases, indirectly. I think yeah. that's important to highlight. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, but somewhere it has to be rooted in a space. It can be space of time, it can be space of memory. Even memory is a space, right? The Z is also a space, like a hard drive. Yes or no? And that space is a very dynamic space for each one of us. Like we say in Allahabad, I'm sure some of you have gone to the Triveni uh, Sangam where the Saraswati, uh, Ganga, and uh, which is the third one? Yamuna. Kunti, actually. Which one? I mean, Kunti. Okay. Yeah. And when they merge, if you've been there, you'll find there is one set of people who are doing the dead, dead people shraddha over there. There'll be another person taking selfie over there. Another person, foreigner, who's come with a lot of guys and talking about that place. The space is the same, but what is the same space? Trigger for each one of them is very different. And the same thing, how space changes from even from the lunar cycle and the solar cycle, from the morning to night, how a carbon park in you know, a time lapse changes, which means what we talk about, let's say, practice of our work, is it relevant at seven o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the night? Like, for example, the foot street of Bangalore, the foot street in the daytime, it is nothing. It's an empty road. In the morning, if you go at eight o'clock, nothing. So the entire food street that we're talking is only the night Ratka memory. Like Manik Chauk in Ahmedabad. If you have to do an archival practice of Manik Chauk, you can't do it at seven o'clock in the morning. It's invalid. So what now can you look at your own spaces and reflect on what is it does to you? and even to the audience at different points of time in the day and where is your work getting a reference is it in the year time or month time for example garba so garba is a uh, once in a year you can't talk about garba in january but the space is the same the ground is the same the lakshmi Palace Lakshmi palace ground if you go in jan and Pepe, is an empty space like kirti mandir Kirtiman, the rest of the year is one between Diwali, it becomes the Rangoli space. So now imagine that space that we refer to and what does space mean to you for your practice? And what have you chosen or what have you reflect, for example, uh, in like example, uh, Nijum said the university, Dhaka University ground. What does that ground do in the daytime? Imagine the space as a character. As a personality, how does it feel in the daytime? How does it feel in the nighttime? And what does that do with your practice or what your chosen subject? So, if you really, I haven't even asked your project work because each one will be a portion for me even to discover. So, when you reflect it now, space, because today we look at people, we look at time and all, but what is space? At once upon a time, at Jalin Walaba. Today, what has happened to Jalan Balabak? It's become an ent entertainment museum. Beautiful. Garba ground became cricket ground, and I actually encouraged cricket in Gujarat. Beautiful. Like a lake in, in, in Bangalore, there's today a bus stop. So, which means there's a generation, of, like in mine also, who don't even remember it as a lake. The lake is still there, apparently. Once it floods, they say that a bus stop has to get cleared overnight. That time is not far. 
and imagine a garba ground visually and then a cricket ground what a massive transition of emotional memory time even a sketch but the ground in the sketch is invisible right when you draw let's say you're painting the entire garba or you're painting the cricket match nobody realizes that the ground is the same and that's what i'm talking about that space in which we root either rooted completely semi somewhere we are rooting our work in space that space could be time also time is also a space let's say uh, which part of the year which part of the time or which part of eons like if you look at gandhi's transition of faces moment you look at gandhi's photo you will say oh this was his childhood days this was his old age so which means time is a space there and that's much of documentation this man has had that moment you see his face you'll say no i think this is between 1986 after his marriage before the second child i know people who told me exactly which day this was shot also by now so much of archiving has happened in this this man so now i'll leave it to you you want to reflect on like i think shwetal's and and beautiful that ground is and if you see that ground is otherwise it's empty so the emptiness to garba to cricket what a that ground is gone and the ground lives after us so the reason why i bring in space is spaces exist before us in our life and after us even objects don't exist even material don't exist museums don't exist but the space exists even looking at rocks and sculptures as a space where sculpt sculpting has happened that rock has travel time the rock would have been a mountain at one point of time cut into place and the space of art has happened on the rock and that is transiting and that is much beyond us oh, anything else so anything that now it triggers you like the garba ground for you what is it? any example any thought any thought? so the project that came to my mind for myself was um, the research on uh, women architects of india which we started and the shift of the space for us the starting space was uh, it was about it was supposed to be about the first generation the ones who worked post independence but because the project had to happen during covid um, tracing the first generation practitioners or their families sitting in bangalore was not possible so inherently started looking at the 21st century women practitioners and suddenly the question of representation sort of backfired in my own in my own understanding because in 21st century the problem was not representation for women architects it was different it was so yes the aim of the project sort of shifted i'm not getting into details but literally felt like so the more i'm now looking at the project we have almost semi launched it and we have to launch it and talk about it the whole purpose you know the, when we say the ground shook it that's how you feel with the project uh, because the duration and the span changed completely and hence the responses in terms of archival content is very different it was always like oh oh ah this also happened oh acha this is how we could have seen it so that's what happened with us in that project We're still trying to make sense of it in fact lovely like sometimes i will even look at the like saris as spaces of people like that sari would have traveled from a grandmother to a mother to a child to next generation but look at the sari as a space in which the human body comes and settles because that sari has more memory than us and now that's where i'm triggering the idea of space like the chair that you all are sitting now has Traveled a certain time to line. That space is not there. Where do we sit on? And that's that's where I'm talking about space. This room that you're all sitting right now, somebody else would have been there before you. Maybe not be the same architecture, but that space. And today, how spaces are changing. Like <clears throat> palaces in India have today become museums. Right at one point of time, this. who 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 are who could enter the palace who couldn't enter the palace who should enter the palace who shouldn't enter the palace was very clear and today from it became a museum how that same space has different movement of people and uh, so my father was a freedom fighter and uh, he was in jail in 1941 42 during the quit india movement and um, uh, he was in sabarmati jail in ahmedabad and 
uh, for years we did not have access to see where he was kept it's only 3 years back that you know when we came to know that the it's going to be pulled down because the building had become derelict is when actually my mom and i and my daughter we went to see the jail and uh, like you said you know the spaces because it was going to be pulled down uh, and suddenly of course i knew everything about my mostly everything about my father's life and the freedom struggle and all of that and suddenly when you see that space it all kind of you know the narrative just becomes different and you kind of put things into perspective and then you know that space is also going to go away right so the the transitory nature of space in that sense the you know the physical uh, transitions also that the space is undergo uh, they also tell you so much about uh, you know the nature of the space so yeah, yeah. in fact amdavad university where it stands it used to be a cricket ground where uh, i used to go for all my walks after my heart breaks so <laughs> and then i see a building there and i'm sitting there in that same office you know <laughs> so it is it, it's a, this is what spaces do it's it's very interesting to actually see the uh, it, it, to see how spaces change yeah no lovely so this is not, like like i'm saying jails in every like freedom park in bangalore it's true it's like a size little park that you can go take selfies and come at one point of time was a notorious place so how we and today a lot of museums by themselves sit like that a lot of public spaces sit on historical oh, yeah. conflict and <clears throat> you go to the residency in lucknow for instance right residency is like only history you have bullet marks of those britishers the you know in the indians who were shot and all of that now it is notorious for a lot of side activities that goes on in residency so yeah it's and now i think spaces increasingly change very quickly also i mean earlier the spaces were a little you know sta stabilized for a few years now i find at least with uh, you know uh, with time uh, increasingly faster that spaces are changing yeah absolutely and now today spaces are also digital because now zoom and google meet is a space right like google meet is there and we will go out somebody else will come into the meeting oh yeah 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 like like how orkut is now archived right <laughs> so so yeah. facebook facebook is going to be archived <laughs> no, this is facebook is only for the older older people the youngsters are not on facebook so number of <coughs> people in facebook is reducing oh yeah, yeah i am told about it <laughs> so in that way how digital space like instagram now look at it as a space what it was before the pandemic post the pandemic and what the space did for even communal uh, uprising the talikata movement completely happened on whatsapp so you know you talking about space again when you talk about storytelling also very interestingly when i go to the classroom and i have to give a context to uh, something that i'm trying to explain the context of the stories also have changed so that space is also changed the storytelling space like nowadays students do not have not read arabian nights you know they they don't know who sinbad the sailor was right they don't know who ali baba was so for me i have had to change even that storytelling within my classroom because the space the you know that space has also changed there i have to talk about netflix i have to talk about something from amazon or netflix to give them examples about what i'm trying to say yeah i, I was in, i was at the indian music experience museum recently i was doing something with the children and at the end <clears throat> as a what you take away so they said uh, we have seen a sitar for the first time we are seeing a harmony for the first time so what we uh, take for granted uh, the entire generation has not even seen musical instruments because oh, yeah, they were yeah, yeah. so this access so everything going to go faster i mean because now uh, a piano today can play sitar sounds to harmonium to uh, flute so why do you even need a flute anymore yeah but now, you know that's what i think yeah but that's where the archives then make more sense right i mean they they actually must be there because otherwise the point of context are all missing i mean what so, well, and the trigger is why is also question right because if you have a, like a tambura you can't get a tambura everywhere in the world it's such a difficult imagine a singer and so that space of music even from a instrument space a flautist has a easier space to carry than a veena player and then the veena gets changed into a certain let's say a laptop or a mobile phone so i'm saying what does it do even to the person who's carrying that space along 
like artists who carry these because without that space their art doesn't like a canvas for example what is a painter without that canvas and what does the canvas do the next generation what is the canvas behind it in front of it is worth lakhs just turn and ask people to buy it so which part of the space is tangible where, where are we talking about what are we referring to so i was very curious at this point if nijum wanted to share why dhaka university as a space is important to her project first of in your in your case the idea of the home has it shifted has it changed especially because your project is so much to do with the space very directly so actually i'm uh, developing the ideas like navigating the objects whatever i have started cataloging so uh, i have prepared a kind of presentation i can share with uh, you all so like how uh, my work is like going on so yeah i'm like uh, using those archival uh, objects like uh, not only objects uh, few materials and all to uh, develop my artwork like how can i uh, facilitate those uh, stories uh, in my artwork like i mean you know, you know so yeah i can share with you all like how i'm like going through the things if you want to share screen and show that will help i mean that can be done right now also okay okay i can just do it uh, meanwhile i would just like to add that the space for me my home it has uh, now changed though i am still living in the same place for the simple reason i lost my husband so the meaning the context everything has uh, changed and uh, i'm really finding it difficult uh, to accept uh, me being in this space alone so so i am thinking that i should uh, document to keep his memory alive for his uh, granddaughter so as to how he uh, comes across through the space how he was using the space the objects maybe uh, she will understand better rather than saying that this my was my grandfather so and so from the uh, album or something like that because i think so vikram to give you a context particularly kostov's work uh, even for us i feel i think i speak for the whole group i think it's so much embedded in the visual that um, the whole project itself that seeing what he's trying or what he's doing might give you also a better sense i know the abstract was there but so yeah um this uh, project i have started after joining this workshop and i, I have thought of like uh, how i can uh, work with archival materials uh as uh, in my artistic practice like i mean i'm i'm not an archivist in the sense but i uh, always uh, found of with archival materials in my home and uh, like how can i use how can i recontextualize it uh, through my practice so mm, this project uh, i uh, uh, is like objects in transit like i'm trying to trace the uh, those objects and stories and narratives like uh, which actually in transition from one space to another space like and the narration is actually through uh, the like i mean you know ships of a family and in context of uh, like omen like my mother her mother and uh, my mother's mother so it's like three generations of uh, bride who are actually coming from one space to another so this project uh, called projotne uh, which i have like i mean it's not a uh, it's like randomly i thought the name this projotne means care of so we always uh, like used to write in our letter or wherever we are uh, addressing our address we use that like care of so mm, and uh, so i'd like to start with this image uh, which is uh actually in joshi d uh, of my maternal grandfather in uh, of my mother uh, who is in his garden who has that uh, business of uh, plants uh, so he is standing in uh, his 
garden at Joshiti, and this photograph is actually uh, from around 1940s, like when my maternal grandfather was around the age of 35. So it's collected from Chuchura, and now it's uh, in collection of my mother, Ratna Chatterjee. So I'm just navi trying to navigate uh, photograph, old photograph as uh, archival objects, memory, and uh, it it could how it could be a tool to uh, like I mean you know re I mean rethink my practice like the home and all. So and this is a page from my scrapbook like what I called Rod Namcha this book titled, and there there is a two photograph of my mother at. Uh, another garden in the in the house of Chuchura, there is also that business of plant shifted in Chuchura due to that uh, partition of Bangla and Bihar after uh, like partition of Bangladesh and India. So it's like uh, that they had to shift from Bihar to West Bengal in some way or like in the barrier of language. So these all are there. Like I have been listening from my mother the stories how they shifted and all so it does objects and uh kind of like a few objects also they lost they've lost a lot of things and uh this this like my i'm just took a photograph of my uh lisa journal that how i'm uh working with uh, the materials and stories like collecting and everyday listening of my uh, mother and grandmother so like I mean, you know, I have a lot of recordings also, like various recordings and all. These letters are uh, uh, from my mother's collection. Her father's letter who was writing. Uh, these letters are from at, actually written at Devghar when they were just tend to shift uh, in Chinshura. And this letter ha contains the like information and emotions also, as uh, Bikram was been mentioning, like the how much brick, uh, like the uh, what could I say the price of bricks like it's like very cheap price and the letters are around from uh, 1960s so a lot of things like the price of a rice I can like I mean you know locate so what was there in uh, like and the main concern with this letter is like uh, the, the time of shifting so I have a lot of I mean my mothers have a lot has a lot of later but I have chosen uh, few, I mean, few of them like four letters from the that collection. This is a small almira. It's a toy almira, uh, which is made of buffalo horn, uh, and it's also in collection of my mother. It's uh, around uh, from 1920s approx. Like how we can locate is like uh, who gave it to my mother and and all elsewhere. So that's how we locate the date. It's not the like, exact date. So I must say. So um, yeah, it's actually given by my maternal uh, grandmother to her from Bangladesh. Actually, my mother's mother is from Bangladesh. So it was like that. So the objects are coming from various places. Now those are stuck in Bonchigram, like where I'm living now. And uh, these are two flower vases also. It's, it's, it's around from uh, like the same uh, time, 19. 20 or 1915 around so these are like made of uh, stained glass amalgam like the kind of glass flowers and this is like i have uh, like jotted down like how objects are coming into a place like there's a few places Joshidi, khulna and shatkira deoghar chuchura and Boichigram. like objects are coming from uh, one place to another through stories, not only objects, through stories, through emotions, and uh, like with the people also, not only like objects are coming, people are shifting, it's like that. And also, the I have been uh, listening through the uh, also the architectural representations, like my mother always used to like uh, commemorate that. Uh, mm, that in our Devghar house was like that. There was 12 rooms, now we have only six. So it's like that. So th there was a, like a big garden, courtyards. So these are like architectural memories also I have been consuming in some way. Also, it's 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 uh, locating the shifts. Ah. 
uh, like three to four places from Deoghar to Chuchura, Chuchura to Boichigram for uh, Chuchura to Boichigram for her marriage. So it's like uh, uh, mobility, how it's uh, occurring. And uh, this is an object uh, gifted by my maternal grandmother to my maternal elder maternal uncle from Bangladesh. I haven't seen that object. I just have listened the uh, like nar narrative of that object, how it is, how it was, but it's not there anywhere in the world. It's I I've discarded somehow. I don't know. But I have drawn the objects that how it could be. So um, it was like that. I can make a painting out of it or make that a sculpture or something like that. But it's it's no longer in the world. But the memory, the emotions, it, it's there. It exists. And this is a just drawing like how my mother has to shift her uh, surname from Mukherjee to Chatterjee. Uh, so it's also a shift. I'm just locating the shifts. So how uh, emotions, memory, and shift works. So yeah, and this is a video works I'm working on with documenting the uh, narrations of with my like. Uh, how she used to narrate those stories with photographs and objects and uh, and the things uh, she can remember whatever and and also this uh, my mother has been how she has been narrating her stories is also there is a part uh, which uh, contains the uh, anecdotes of katha like uh, there's a like very interesting. It's it, I would say it's a story, like my uh, maternal. Uh, my, I mean I mean my mother's grandmother came. I mean shifted from Bangladesh to Kolkata, and uh, they brought a uh, few money. Like I mean you know how they bought those money with the katha, like stitched within the katha, uh, and it became uh, like they actually avoided the scrutiny in the borders. So it was really interesting for me to like, and also the story how they built a small iron work, workshop in near Bamungachi, West Bengal. So it's like the story of transition, like see how they like develop their inhabitation in another country. It became another country, how it was. So now I have started working uh, with, now I can just share a few works. My collaborator here is my mother. She's helping me with making katha like i'm started making a large large scale katha like a uh, few i have started already so she's helping me she is a collaborator i think i mean i would say like that i don't know but yeah she's happily collaborating and you doing are, and telling her, her story yeah you are her collaborator she is a main artist yeah yeah some, somehow like that <laughs> Actually, uh, we both are doing like my mother is doing from that end. I'm doing from this end. It's like that. So oh, mm, how how yeah. how are you able to bring in her practice into contemporary? Yeah, 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 yeah. So mm, and these are like process. I was been washing her old clothes, sharis, and making it in a like I mean worthy to work. Like all those everyday stresses she I mean, that had in like in the sari like oils and kitchen marks etc so it's somehow it's removed but it's there definitely so and uh, you can see the i i have removed the shari borders here it's like only the body part so this is a formation of katha like it's like initiate i mean initial stage so and all and uh, then uh, the two media three mediums I'm working with uh, within the concept concept like it's a trans I don't know trans uh, medial or something I can say it, uh, whatever so it's like how uh, whatever medium I'm feeling it can go I'm using this so mm, I'm also working with book like bookmaking and. Uh, how it can work with the idea of shifts and the stories, objects. So I'm planning, I'm also making of books, like few books, and, and amalgamating with those photographs, like 
recreating and reprinting those photographs in a certain manner and placing and uh, like just juxtaposing randomly in a book format these are this is a one example uh, it's not the final one or it's there is no final thing but it's like i'm just putting and uh, looking at how it work how it will work or something like that it's like it's working with architecture namely like architectural space how she has uh, been uh, like i mean demonstrated like that ki the architecture was like that and i put uh, there her like her image and her husband and like sons and daughters so it's like that in a way uh, the ships and the space the architecture is in another space but the photographs is in another space like uh, i mean like conjugating the two different spaces in one space and how it could be a readable object so it's actually not that archiving any particular archival object but it's ar ar archiving the stories archiving the emotions i have she has and the family or i, I mean it's a community has so yeah this is also another format of book i have been working and uh, it is it also it would be illustrated in some way like katha also katha would be also illustrated and books are would be also illustrated in some way it's not like a painting as such like in a hierarchical manner it's a painting it's like illustration or doing just to translate the narrations i have i have been listening and so on so this is a photograph of the new built house at chinsura i just conclude with this photograph and and yeah it's a garden it was a garden then the three children were there my mother's cousins and uh, now this garden is also disappeared with a multi stories apartment so it's not there so it became i mean anybody couldn't find anything any traces of this garden but i have seen like but yeah it's completely disappeared so yeah thank you did the three of them go there and take the photo again like replicate the same dress yeah, <laughs> yeah it can be try that i'm saying that's that's yeah that's, yeah that's... yeah yeah it's, it would be a nice idea so ha huh, three of them are here like that that's the rapid change of spaces like today the idea of space for me is like saying what was space in 100 years is now becoming 20 years and now it's becoming 5 years 2 years 1 year like the change of space the delta of change is much more smaller what do 100 years to change now take maybe 10 years to change and now if you go to coastal karnataka or anyway you'll see how roads are expanding like i'm right now as i'm talking today i heard how natrani uh, was in 1995 and then the first student who did the show uh, uh, i just met her in the morning and she said to dance here i said where on the road so today's road is where the stage was so what was her memory of the stage with malika sarabai is today just a road just a road the sense for people for even for me it was a road so how that is concerned the same so yeah that's the space aspect of it yes yeah, shweta's question about is it why you feeling need to archive question mark not on one multiple rapid loss of space lap changes in people's like how even people's dressing is slowly changing this is another thing that i like, like textile and how we would four generations together how much of change when our dressing is changing so yes physical space is definitely one so space in multiple contexts what means to each one of us is um, like freedom park like i said in bangalore how for like like spaces like spaces which we keep moving away somebody else will come and occupy space is the same like as when in our 20s we'll we'll occupy a certain space let's say we might go to a lot of i mean even a recreation center or something in 30s same people so we'll go to maybe hospitals more and then 40s we'll go to children's i'm just talking about the progression of life but the space attracts people again from a different generation like brigade road i think let's say 2000 when maybe when um, i moved to bangalore would have been one and now i might go to another space but the people coming to brigade road is still the same the space is still the same and how people come and go people come and go look at like a past moving thing and we might move and say oh those days i used to go there regularly we use that context a lot of times but the space is still the same and how we've moved away and how we've moved our space 
into something else. Our interests have changed. So our, maybe our space in that context has also changed in that way. So those days I used to go a lot of, let's say, marathons. And today I do a lot of sketching. But the marathon is continuing to happen. We moved our space from that space to another realm. So uh, may I show a picture in the... So uh, this is the photo from Mongol Shubha Jatra 1989. Um, I'm going to archive here in this project, Mahabubu uh, Rahman and Toyeba Begum Lipi. And the time zone is 90s, uh, mostly from late 80s to 90s. So uh, why the place in Dhaka University area is important? But because uh, the partition is initially happened in 1905. and it's closed in 1911, uh, 1911. And after that, there is a political decision that uh, we need to create a university in this area. And then 1921, Dhaka University created. And all of our presidents, scholars, uh, prime ministers, political persons, uh, scientists, cultural persons, all are from Dhaka University. So <laughs> this is the story of Bangladesh. If you want to uh, dig out any one of them in a particular place, they are from Dhaka University. Uh, the language movement in 1952, born in Dhaka University, the 71 uh, liberation where before the liberation where there is the, uh, there was a uh, uh, flag, uh, flag, uh, uh, we used to use our flag here in Dhaka University campus the first time. Uh, there is a genocide place in Dhaka University campus. The mother language movement also happened in Dhaka University campus. So if you give a work through in the Dhaka University area or side, beside the area of Dhaka University, you can find all the history in Bangladesh on this zone. So that's why when I uh, look through the Mahabubu Romans and Lipi, Tawabegum Lipi's archival journey, uh, their journey in late, uh, late 80s, I can find also a movement, Mongol Shobha Jatra. This is also happened in Dhaka University area. And just 1989, uh, before 1989, maybe uh, the Fine Art Institute associated with Dhaka University in 1983. So because of that, this movement also is a part of Dhaka University. So this is a vibrating area always. And we did a movement in 2013 uh, because of the war criminals in Dhaka University area. So if you started from the Shahabad zone to an, any kind of uh, uh, ending place of Dhaka University area or nearest the Dhaka University area, you can find a story or you can find a, any kind of place related to history of Bangladesh. And if I want to display my archival project here, either it's the gallery in General Abidin Bhavon in Fine Arts Faculty, or is the nearest uh, alias gallery near the Anmundi area. So I never can thought that I will do my project show, I will show my project in Gulshan area because no one is here. Only the edit paper people live in the Gulshan area or the Uttara or the other parts, parts of the Dhaka, uh, Dhaka or in the country. Because uh, where the two artists born and when they did this movement, Mongol Shubha in 1899, they were in only second year students and all of their batchmates were involved in this movement. So if I uh, want to dig out about Mongol Shubha Jatra, Mahabubu Rahman is included there. The mask you can see, uh, these uh, mask forms are uh, created by him, the dyes are created by him. He find out these forms from the library books. And uh, then this has happened with the paper mesh process. So uh, and now the designs have changed, but this is the 1899, and you can see the people crowd and horse form. This is a signature movement uh, uh, in Mahabu Roman's later period works. Then he used horse in his many uh, performance. And you can see the horse here also that carried by the human. And the designs are doing by other persons, but initially this is the design by him. And uh, all these things are connected in the campus. If someone do something in Bangladesh, it's connected with this campus. So I think I will uh, show my project in a public place, either in Dhaka University, inside the Dhaka University, or the nearest place of Dhaka University, where I can connect all my junior, all my senior, all my teachers, and all my cultural persons or 
all any kind of things then please come to the nearest campus area dhanmundi to the alias or the general abidin gallery etc so i think uh this is a very historical place for us in the country and another uh Another uh, important incident happened there in 7 March 1971. The Bongo Bundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman announced a kind of partial announcement for the war. Uh, this is the also park here, the Sora Di Uddan. So uh, oh, this is a very important zone for me. So that's why I choose this area, Dhaka University area, as um, my uh, project and importance of my project. And especially when I took an inter interview with, Ma with Mahabur Rahman, I uh, find this relevant so much now. Thank you to cooperating as your, your own personal space through the Dakas. I think I found it very fascinating that you already feel that the project needs to be in a public space. Um, and there's so much for it to say. And I think what we have recognized earlier in your archiving project is that there will always be gaps about the socio-political narrative, about um, even the social politics of arts in Dhaka and in the South Asia. But I think putting it out in the public space might actually mean, of course, critique, but also might mean uh, somebody will also come and fill in those gaps, I would want to hope. Because what I was observing right now, for example, in this photograph, and I think we've seen this before, but I didn't observe it then, is the fact that women are so missing from the scene um, it's so many just men in that, in that men uh, who can be recognized as men. I still don't know what gender they would associate with. And then when you say you want to put out Lipi Tayaba's history and hence Mehboob Rehman's history, so you're also approaching an archiving project in in a direction which is not necessarily a conventional thought. And then when you put it on a public space, will it be discomforting? Will it be overly applauded because you did something different? I mean, I'm just wondering about all the possible community responses. Yeah, but my basic concept is how the artists are born. Uh, it's not about that, what they are did now, how they are born and how their social and political condition shape them, uh, form them, how difficult the things in this time. So I want to pick up all this information. I still and am trying. What, what were they fought for or what happened? A ripple of that is something that's going to touch you today at the Dhaka University. So what do you, if you walk around or you're there, there, there is some result of what they did in that space. That ripple is coming into your life today in some form. So there will be a connect. It's, you, can't, you won't be completely away from that. There will be something that you're connected. So like a flashback. But then you go back for you also, like, oh, this is in the university when you walk today. And because they did so much there, that means something to you today in that space. Yeah. So um, I don't know if Gita is here, but uh, she she had she has mentioned in her abstract also that one project is about, of course, her husband and the family history. But second project she wants to do is about the neighborhood of DTN and the Love. fact that 30 years, even though it's 30 years young, there is so much to tell about the neighborhood and how, in that case, the community actually comes together to put together an archive like that. You no, did you want to add to that? You'll have to unmute. And it is a drastic change that has happened. I moved here in here in 1991, and it was maybe in 1988 that that layout was formed. And people were saying that, uh, how come you're moving to a godforsaken place from Benson Town? Benson Town in Central uh, uh, District was uh, so very, uh, very popular address. We are going into a far off place, so far off. But today, this is a, uh, this is a, I mean, with the metro station coming, it is a ticket to, uh, I don't know, the prices, real estate prices have increased and you have a good proportion of the IT people. And I think the entire uh, topography and uh, also the type of people that were there earlier, it was most bank people. Now you find it is taken over by the IT and there were so much of orchards wherein there were mango trees, sapota trees and uh, uh, cash crops like that. Today it is all uh, uh, multi storied buildings and apartments. The face has changed, the space has changed. And before people forget 
the BTM of uh, uh, 40 years or so, I thought, let me take this as a project on behalf of uh, Destination so, Heritage. So I'm saying, I think in Ishita is in our own life, I've seen BTM without the metro train where I can see the sky. So yes. you cannot see the sky on that road. The sky, it's one of those areas going to be completely covered with a flyover and a metro station in the same road and no sunlight. So it's going to be a non-sunlit road. And there was a time, uh, Vikram, that there was no road. In 1989, when we shifted here, the uh, autos refused to come beyond uh, the Jayadeva. It was a circle point there. They refused to come beyond that. And it was very scary for us to move the rice to come from the bank. It was uh, I used to come from the bank around 7, 7.30. And then uh, it would be very eerie because nobody used to come. And my husband used to come to pick me up at some point, And we used to go. There was Aikobu Nagar, the bank officer's uh, colony. And then we got a proper road when uh, um, previous um, the president, uh, Sanjeev Kumar, uh, when he uh, married, uh, his son married a daughter, a police officer's daughter. We got a road. And we got a telephone, uh, telecom uh, uh, office also there. Till such time, we had no such facility. It is no telephone tower, nothing like that. So that was the time. And to think now that there is a traffic jam happening every day at 8 o'clock near the silk board. It is, uh, we have traveled so much and things have changed so much that uh, I myself am surprised because uh, in those days at about 10 o'clock, these Maruti cars, the vans, they, they used to have the film in them and they used to carry, uh, I think, uh, so many of those weapons from Hosur to this thing. There used to be a check post uh, uh, almost uh, near the bank officer's colony before you come into the, um, uh, the Jaideva. So there used to be a police uh, checkup to see if what they are doing, if it is activities. And sometimes we would see that uh, the we would get up in the night at about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, because those vehicles were stopped by the uh, police. It was unexpected, putting full brake, and they're trying to escape a, a police going behind them. There were lots of drama happening also. So to think that in that place today we have a, a flyover coming and all that, I think there will be so many old timers here who can add value addition to what I'm saying. So I, I'm going to like barge in again. I have stayed in BTM layout, but this was in 2000s. And for me, I have no idea about anything of what you said about BTM layout, because for me, it was like a migrant uh, hub, you know, because there were so many migrants like us who were in BTM. And uh, uh, I mean, I lived in a really, really small, uh, cramped place. Um, but I do remember that uh, it was fairly multicultural uh, by the time we were there in the 2000s. So and, and I do remember because I used to teach at Christ University. So for me, it was close by. So which is where I used to stay at BTM. But um, I mean, for me, I have a very different perception about BTM. Uh, so it would really help to, especially when you talk about community archiving and, you know, uh, all of that, this, this sort of a, uh, you know, just even a center there to kind of show what BTM used to be and what it is now uh, would give a good perspective because for somebody like me, I have no idea, right? I mean, I'm just staying there temporarily and, you know, then moving out and um, and, and Christ College was considered godforsaken. The word used was oh, yeah, yeah. Christ College, you know that. Think and today, College, they, today they have it a second branch yeah. operating from Banargata campus. And it has got about five to 6,000 uh, stronghold uh, student community there. And there you have you find lots of PG apartments coming. All the students yeah, have yeah. found accommodation there. So that's again yeah. evolving into a... Avrekere. Avrekere is where the students... <laughs> now it is Arikere also. Hulimavu and Arikere. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. No, I do have... You know, BTM, I remember because that was the one place where we'd get little chokha. Special curator goes only on Bangalore and his arcade lanes. <laughs> So it is, I mean, last thing, I mean, I, like, for example, the, the Jayadeva underpass, I see it being built, I'm seeing it being destroyed both at the same time. In in 20 yeah. years, the flyovers got broken and built. And so who else is, who, what, what joy? But you have to give employment, no, Vikram? How, will, how are we going to create employment if we don't pull down things and then get them up again? Yeah, that's <laughs> Today with metros, you'll see how metro is uh, driving unwanted. I don't even know what's needed. Like Indore has a metro station. It does enough roads to go, but why do you need a metro? Because the capitalist 
world. I'm saying I know metros in India is still a subject to think of. Do we need it? Do we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ahmedabad also has a metro now. Yeah, I mean, who's going to use love it? It's a question. Let's still have some, like Bhopal, Indore. I mean, no idea why metro is coming into places where there's still lovely roads. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's some question across India. I'm asking why do we why does the city need a uh, metro itself? I mean, why do what are we doing? To Maybe based on population projections and all of that is when they're deciding population projection, uh, the vehicles and all of that. Maybe I mean, at least the rationale doesn't come out clearly when they construct. There's no rational, there's no map. For like example, the Bangalore <laughs> metro <laughs> when the design. I mean, look at the initial design and the need of it and then now how it's stalled at a lot of like Kormangala, the flyover has uh, uh, now full trees growing on the flyover because it's been stopped for three years four years so how do we look at development as pausing to even just move around mm. planning mm. yeah yeah no but the I BTM thing kind of... uh... sorry mm. go on no 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 go on go on so in this kind of rapid uh, change which we are all sort of talking about i'm just connecting it back to so this is why again archiving at personal or at community level as tana was also highlighting is becoming very critical because constantly one of the questions we are asking at this end while we are doing these programs is that why are we doing these programs why are there takers for it why is there so much of an interest so one reason was obviously pandemic. OK, suddenly everybody's inward looking. But no, it's not just that. The fact that uh, history is being rewritten so fast, so quickly, that you said that Chittendulkar has already become an archive, uh, or neighborhoods are changing, so cities are changing so drastically. Reasons are many, and because of which archiving is becoming a very critical form of knowledge production rather than the slow invested research. Of course, archiving is also slower. But at least you are able to collect maybe faster than uh, getting into just an academic research of reading into materials and waiting for things to waiting for the gestation period because you never know things will be lost. So now the, the it's not the unsung which we are worried about. Now it's about things will be lost to time because we don't even know what to keep and not keep when places are changing. So we are all discarding this first exercise that we did Vikram. The question was, what are we discarding and why? There's a lot of discarding happening when we move, but are we very conscious of what we are discarding and why? And so it's it's applicable at a very larger scale as well when these things change in a city. So I just wanted to bring it to that point. Why why are we talking about these changes in the spaces? Um, if any, if you feel differently, if anybody has a different thought around it. I want to to add one thing like uh, it's also like uh, you can say it's a story like when uh, my maternal grandmother um, came to uh, I mean like uh, her he married I mean she married a um, uh, man in the, the marriage ceremony was uh, like before partition so she uh, I mean came to from uh, Shatkira or Khulla to uh, i mean deoghar so that time it was like a one country and uh, i have listened that story like from my grandmother so she, after her marriage she never went to uh, bangladesh i mean that time it was not like that bangladesh india it was a bengal so she never went to that her uh, like uh, her place so uh, after so she was very like uh, when after partition, she just asked her husband to go for uh, her place. So, so her husband like said like I have listened this from my, my grandmother. See, her husband said that no, you can't go now anymore because it's in another country. So when she came to uh, her like uh, came to this place because of marriage, it was not that kind of space. But space changed after partition like when it became a, another country so she can't go easily so that's why she even never uh, i mean went to that place after her marriage so it was like i uh, realized somehow ki how actually not the like family not the home changes it's like a uh, whole country changes like uh, 
uh, through the family like a small story small emotions it's it's actually up to the greater national thing i i don't know it's a it's really and also but a societal thing, yeah. thing right so i yeah. have a very similar story with my grandmother being from karachi and when i asked her i didn't ask her much is my problem but i just remember asking her as a very young girl why didn't you go back i mean of course i knew the political answer but i think between their marriage and the pakistan becoming a different country and all of that her answer was that oh but after marriage you don't even think about going back to your hometowns so it was also a societal conditioning that there was no yearning that i felt in her that oh I, we don't have any more reminiscence of our homes in karachi we can't show it to our grandchildren anything like that for her it was a given that yes now we are married and it was not that far away they were in himmatnagar so the 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 land is really connected from there so it was not even distance or logistics she just said yeah you don't go after you're married into uh, married into another state or a city so that now when i think about it is so painful that not just the political narrative but the society also inhibits you from reconnecting back with your spaces and i don't know if no we don't have any archives of them so that that history yes. is yes. now in that case like uh, partition became an excuse only there is a lot of another issue <laughs> because now it's another country you can't go easily so it's a excuse on yeah i get it actually no, it's that also 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 gets me to look at the question of memories because memory studies is also coming up in a very big way along with archives and history memory studies uh, by its, by itself as a discipline is also picking up and uh, what we choose to remember and how we choose to remember also has uh, enough politics around it right be it the smallest of personal memories to the memories of a place to a city to a nation uh what are the memories that we choose to uh, preserve and what are we what are the ones that we discard so for instance my research looks at the memories which uh have not been preserved or or were very clearly sidelined because of the region that that i'm looking at so um so memory studies also might be uh, an interesting place for everyone here to also explore maybe just read up about memory studies and 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 um yeah so you know like like shwetal says it is letting go was so much easier for older generation and moving on um uh, are we the spectator <laughs> more than people living it so yeah so again what we choose to really retain and what we choose to discard uh, also keeps changing uh, with with time uh, that is very important to kind of keep in mind yeah one thing like what what can be published in that also a question in context of uh, privacy so it's like what memory we we can publish in a like an, in a form of art or in a form of written format mm. so in my case when i am working with my family narratives so my family members always used to say that why are you uh, like making it public so it's our private thing it's a private story why are you making it public and also I have heard that uh, Naim uh, said uh, Naim Mohamed from Bangladesh. She, uh, I mean, he mentioned in a talk. I have heard that uh, her mother, I mean, his mother uh, asked him to like, ki uh, like, reshabni uh, ghata ghati kora Like, don't go into these uh, narratives, like political narratives and all. It's our personal thing. So it's always happened when we are like we. is to deal with the personal narrative so it's also that thing and that... and it's not just personal kausta it is also when you deal with a uh, larger other narratives also you know like the the archives i look at uh, they come from a political office but they are also equally i mean they there is sensitive bits to them also which you can't talk about so uh, but i agree at a more personal level you have more control on you know you you have a little more information about what you want to publish not publish um, at at the larger level maybe there are more stakeholders and therefore it becomes a little more complex yeah it's yes. sometimes just to pause and reflect is so important i mean at least i'm glad that i i sh i shook my work is done by shaking conversations i'm a sutra dar you are all practitioners and i think it, i mean i was just waiting for us to reach the end for all of us to also be able to see why the shaking was important um we did this last year also last to last edition basically um 
is to say that we have until now in the workshop talked about the the more traditional practices of archiving which is record management collecting the resources um uh, thinking about the architecture of the archive but those were all very uh, data driven slightly inanimate ways of approaching the archive and this version of looking at the stories the emotion also needs to bring us back so the all the data management and the record sheets that we need to make or we should make in the more traditional sense they need not be devoid of these kind of stories and reasons and factors they also can find a uh, space in the keyword mapping the archives can become more living so the changing times changing landscapes and the changing stories of your objects and emotions should become a part of could become a part of the archiving practice as well sometimes many archivists also say that these exercises help you do those uh, boring jobs more easily so that's also a way to put it but that is why this shaking uh, with the help of a theatrical performer usually has helped us um, in terms of thinking of archiving practices so that's with that we can take a pause um, tana had some very interesting thoughts about her work i think that smoothly takes us into the afternoon session um, and with a very 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 um, happy heart thank you so much vikram for joining us online from another place in between of your travels and we hope that you make it to your flight thank in time stay in your world i mean it's i take this back into my world again thing i mean i learned from all of you to take it back to my performance so a lot yes. of the public do not understand such worlds exist <laughs> perfect thank you so much and uh, thank you everyone for engaging so thoroughly